So we're back to doing Batman stuff. Hopefully I can get this out in time for the Batman or at least around the time of its release. If I do, great. If I don't, doesn't really matter to you because you're watching this now. So let's talk about the weird world of Batman and characters related to him, like Robin, Harley Quinn, Catwoman, the Suicide Squad. Shut up, I know Batman's not in the Suicide Squad, but Red Hood and Harley Quinn are there, and so is Deathstroke and Deadshot, and Penguin's in the new game. Look, I, we're going to talk about some stuff from that, too. All I know, you could be Batman! I am not Batman. I'm Batman. Kingdom Come. From May 1996 to August of that year, an Elseworlds miniseries titled Kingdom Come was released by DC. Written by Mark Wade and Alex Ross, with art being done by the latter, this story takes place in a world where the Justice League, including Batman, quit being superheroes after the public was tired of them not killing the villains, and starts supporting a new hero named Magog, who just kind of kills every villain under the sun. And with no other heroes around, a new generation of superpower beings rise up, and they just kind of go to town on each other in battles that basically level cities with no distinction between heroes and villains. But anyways, how does Batman fit into all this? Well, Batman isn't doing all that hot, as he's one of the few superheroes that refuses to work with Superman, because Superman had been in Earth for 10 years, and Batman's not exactly about to forgive him. His back is also completely destroyed, and he needs to use a back brace that's more like an exoskeleton to help him move around and fight, though he mostly just uses drones to do his crime fighting. I should also mention this Batman doesn't really have an issue with putting, like, inhibitor collars on criminals to keep them in check, so he's kind of a more of a morally gray Batman. This story received critical acclaim and is looked at as one of the best Elseworld stories. It was even used as inspiration twice in the Arrowverse, with one of them being an old Batman played by the Batman himself, Kevin Conroy. Batman with a gun. As everybody knows by now, originally Batman didn't have a no-gun rule. Now why was this? Well, Batman was inspired by a lot of Pulp Fiction heroes like Zorro, the Phantom, and most famously the Shadow, and uh, that dude didn't really have a problem with shooting criminals. Eventually though, Batman was given the no gun rule when DC flat out just couldn't figure out a reason why he'd use a gun when none of the other DC heroes at the time used one. So as soon as the comics began to delve into Bruce Wayne's backstory, the no gun rule was put into effect. Uh, insert joke here about Batman breaking every bone in a criminal's body and leaving them in medical debt for the rest of their lives here. Batburger. Created in 1966 for the Adam West Batman series, Batburger is a fast food restaurant named after Batman. Batman and Robin themselves even went there time to time. And that's where Batburger stayed for decades until 2017, when in Batman issue 16, it was brought back into the main DC universe. But this time the place is decked out in Batman merch. Imagine going to a burger joint only to see like 10 different guys dressed up as the clown that murdered your family like two months ago. You might be wondering how this is legal in the DC Universe, like can't Batman just sue them? Well, Batman's not copyrighted in the DC Universe, so anybody can use the Batman name or logo. Bruce also eats burgers with a fork and knife. How rich. Also the riddle me fish sounds very dangerous. Batman Town. Batman Turkey is a city in Turkey that was named that in 1957, but not after the character. Instead, the city was renamed after the Batman River. It's got a population of roughly 600,000, and there's a university there called Batman University. Also, its mayor in 2008 declared that the city would be suing Warner Bros. and Christopher Nolan while they were making The Dark Knight. With him even saying, There is only one Batman in the world. The American producers used the name of our city without informing us. No lawsuit ever came to be, so it's safe to say he only did this to boost tourism or something. I really wish he did go to court, though. Imagine being the judge in that situation. Batman and Captain America. So in my infinite wisdom, I somehow forgot to talk about the Batman and Captain America crossover comic from December of 1996. This is especially embarrassing because this is the comic that includes the iconic I may be a criminal lunatic, but I'm an American criminal lunatic scene. Anyways, in this story written by John Bryan, Captain America and Bucky are given a secret mission to go to Gotham City to stop Red Skull, who's teamed up with the Joker. And of course, while they're there, they meet up with Batman and Robin. But shockingly, the duo duos don't actually stop Red Skull. Instead, Red Skull is stopped by Joker, who realizes that... Wait, the dude with the swastika on his chest is actually a Nazi? But Joker ends up dying from this as both he and Red Skull are killed by a goddamn nuke. Now, as I mentioned in my Spider-Man Iceberg, all the Batman crossovers, like the Spider-Man ones, the Punisher one, etc., along with the Marvel Transformers crossover, all take place in the same continuity. However, this story doesn't. 
This story takes place on Earth 3839, and the comic also takes place in the 1940s. The author of the comic, John Bryan, also wanted to make another crossover sequel to this comic, but Marvel and DC at the time weren't interested. So instead, he made a sequel that just focused on DC characters, Superman and Batman Generations. Dark Knights Dark Knights Metal is an event storyline that ran from June 2017 to March 2018 that dealt with Batman and the Justice League battling a team of evil Batman from across the multiverse. This is where the Batman Who Laughs comes from, but when I talked about him previously, I failed to mention the rest of the team. The team is called the Dark Knights, and there's a ton of them. So I'm just going to mention the few that I find the most interesting out of the team, that either appear in the Dark Knights Metal or its sequel Dark Knights Death Metal. Or don't appear in either, but I'm just going to throw them in anyways because they're interesting. There's Murder Machine Batman, from a world where Alfred was brutally murdered in the Batcave by Batman's villains, which drove him into a depression. He then asked Cyborg to make an Alfred AI, and uh, that went badly, as Alfred AI went haywire and began murdering every criminal as it deemed it was a threat to Batman. And then the AI took over Batman's mind since it believed that Batman couldn't keep himself safe, and yeah, he just started murdering everyone. There's Dawnbreaker Batman, who's basically... What if Batman got a Green Lantern ring right after his parents were murdered, and then used the ring to murder Joe Chill? This was only possible after he corrupted the ring with his tainted soul. And then, yeah, he started killing people. But he did briefly resurrect his parents as zombies, though. Originally, he'd only kill criminals, but then after a fight with Gordon, he killed them, and then he decided to kill the entire Green Lantern Corps, and... Just a lot of killing. There's Devastator Batman, who is Batman who took the Doomsday virus and basically became Doomsday after ingesting it. He only did this to stop an evil Superman from killing Justice League, but after killing Superman, the virus began to spread around him and basically destroyed his world. There's Castle Bat, which is a literal sentient city, which was created after Bruce Wayne decided to merge his soul with Gotham and, uh, yeah, I mean, that, that, that will do it. That will do it. There's the merciless Batman who became the god of war after thinking Ares killed Wonder Woman, and so in, in revenge, he decided to kill Ares. He became the god of war after putting on the god of war's helmet and got all of his powers. And when Wonder Woman was revealed to have survived, she tried to take the helmet away, and Batman was like, nah, and murdered her. He then started killing criminals, and then his friends, and then all the Amazons, and I think you know where I'm going with this. There's Red Death Batman, who defeated all of Flash's enemies, and then used their powers and gadgets to defeat the Flash, to gain his powers. Kind of like a Mega Man situation. He wanted Flash's power so he could use the Speed Force to make sure he could defeat all the city's crime. He then absorbed Barry Allen into him, and then just began murdering criminals, despite having Barry in his head begging him to stop. There's the Drowned Batwoman, aka Bryce Wayne, who murdered every supervillain in her gender-bent world, and then said, Hey, those pesky Atlanteans might be bad, and killed their queen as a way of saying, Don't mess with the surface. And then in response, Atlantis drowned most of the world, including Gotham City. Batwoman then eventually performed surgery on herself to make herself aquatic, and then conquered the entire world. There's the Batman who frags, who... I mean, he's just Lobo, but Batman. He took some of Lobo's species' DNA to give him superpowers, and instead it just kind of turned him into an evil Lobo. There's Batmobeast, who was simply a monster truck Batmobile with the mind of Bruce Wayne in it. He did this originally because Batman was like, Hey, I'm gonna put my conscience into every digital system of the planet so I can watch everyone. And then when people were like, What? No! And so they destroyed every piece of technology with Bruce Wayne's intelligence in it, except for the Batmobeast. There's Dark Father, who's Batman for killing Darkseid. And after taking his powers, he then mastered the anti-life equation and altered all the parademons to look like Demon Robins. There's Grim Knight, who's Batman who just loves guns. He even killed Joe Chill moments after he killed Bruce's parents, and later killed all of Gotham's richest people by burning them alive. Basically, he's Batman who replaced his morality with guns and mass surveillance. There's the Batman Asaurus Rex, aka B-Rex. In his universe, Batman uploaded his consciousness into the mechanical T-Rex he had in his Batcave. And just like everybody else that I've mentioned so far, he was just like, I'm gonna start killing people. There's an evil Batman robot T-Rex, and that's just incredible to me. And finally, because I think I've talked about this for too long, there's Mindhunter, who is literally just Batman who stole Martian Manhunter's DNA to become stronger than Superman. And that just kind of made him bad, I guess. Dark Knights of Steel. Dark Knights of Steel is an extremely recent limited series that began in January of this year, 2022, in case you're watching this like a year later or something, and is scheduled to go on for 12 issues. 
It's pretty much what if Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, Green Arrow, Harley Quinn, etc. were in medieval times. Kind of like Marvel 1602, but just a, a lot further back in history. In this universe, Batman is the Bat Prince and is the bastard son of King Jor-El, which makes him the half-brother of Superman, who is the king in this universe. I don't want to say anything else about the series though, as it's still going on, but if it sounds interesting, you should check it out. Jurassic League. This is an upcoming series being released in May 2022 that will go on for about six issues to tell the story of what if the Justice League and their villains were anthro dinosaurs? The concept of this comic came from both the comic writers, Daniel Warren Johnson and Juan Gadian, who said they both loved dinosaurs and anthro creatures. So they went to DC and were like, you want to make a Dino Justice League? And uh, DC was just kind of like, okay, sure. This series gets inspiration from Street Sharks, Primal, Team and T, Primal Rage, and Age of Reptiles, with the Joker Dilophosaurus also being modeled off of Heath Ledger's Joker. So, that's something. And look, Batman's a T-Rex. Again, Big Top. First appearing in Batman and Robin issue 1 in August 2009, Big Top is a villain who is part of the group The Circus of Strange, and is a very large person. According to the DC Wiki, they weigh at least 567 pounds and are 5 foot 9. What are their powers? They got a gun that can fire off gas that makes people hallucinate, and they're large and in charge. Only oh, they're not actually in charge, they work for Mr. Toad. And that's kind of it. Big Top hasn't really done much at all, just kind of show up and be weird. In fact, according to Comic Vine, they've only appeared in about 18 issues in both pre- and post-New 52. The Batman vs. Hush Originally, there was going to be another film set in the Batman cartoon's continuity, but it wouldn't be a sequel to Batman vs. Dracula. Titled The Batman vs. Hush, the film would have Hush as the main villain, with Clayface, Riddler, Catwoman, Penguin, and Joker all making appearances throughout the film. This film was planned out for quite some time, but ultimately it was scrapped. And seeing how there hasn't been anything related to this cartoon in years, I think it's safe to say, this film will never happen. Batman Incorporated This is an organization served by Bruce Wayne, who created the organization after traveling through time, which I mentioned in the last iceberg. It's an international organization to create Batman across the world, as Bruce Wayne handpicks crime fighters and then makes them the Batman representatives of, of their country. Created by Grant Morrison in Batman and Robin 16 in January 2011, it's grown to include many different Batman, like the Batman of Moscow, the Batman of China, Night Runner, Batwing, Red Bird, Dark Ranger, Wingman 2, the Batman of Japan, The Hood, etc. But what some people might know is that this isn't a new idea. Batman Incorporated is actually a spiritual successor of Batman of All Nations. This originated in Detective Comics issue 215 in January of 1955, and was pretty much the exact same idea. It had members like the Musketeer, the Squire, Man of Bats, Raven Red, Wingman, John Mayhew, and the Ranger. Yeah, well, John Mayhew wasn't like a crime fighter, he was just like a millionaire that brought them together, but still, it, he was technically part of the team. Condiment King? Condiment King is often listed as one of the worst villains of all time, because, I mean, look at him. And sure, he's goofy and dumb, but I wouldn't call him one of the worst villains of all time, because, like, the difference between, like, Condiment King and, say, Big Wheel or, the, like, let's say the Asthma Monster, for example, is that those ones are meant to be taken seriously. Okay, well, maybe the Asthma Monster wasn't meant to be taken seriously, but still. Condiment King was created as a joke character for Batman the Animated Series with an origin story that saw him as a stand-up comedian named Buddy Stadler, who was brainwashed to ruin his reputation. Originally only appearing in the animated series, he would eventually make his comic debut in Detective Comics issue 1000, released in May 2019, where he shows up with his sidekicks, Salt and Pepper. A different condiment cane named Mitchell Mayo would also appear in The Birds of Prey, issue 37, released in January 2002, and is treated as a joke character yet again. And then he shows up again in Final Crisis Aftermath issue 4 in October 2009, where he actually just dies. I love the DC wiki lists, kind of at King's only weakness as being mentally ill. Oh, and uh, yeah, Mitchell Mayo also shows up in Batman issue 9 in December 2016 in the mainline DC universe, and was originally a villain who then decided to become a restaurant owner on Coney Island, but then went back to being a criminal. And now I will use this opportunity to explain how to make him a serious character. Make him a one-off villain in the beginning of a gay movie or comic, then never refer to him as Condiment King, and base him off the 1982 Chicago Tylenol murders. But instead of Tylenol, it's condiments. You may think I'm joking, but I genuinely think this idea could work. Cancelled Suicide Squad game. 
In 2013, the Lost Arkham game, Batman Arkham Origins Blackgate, was released, and teased the Suicide Squad game at the very end of the game, with Amanda Waller getting Deadshot, Deathstroke, and Bronze Tiger in it. Ultimately, though, this wouldn't lead into a game, but instead the film Assault on Arkham, which might still be canon? But anyways, this was actually meant to lead into a game set in the Arkhamverse about the Suicide Squad, and it would have been made by Warner Bros. Montreal. This game was in production for quite some time, until eventually it was revealed the game was cancelled in 2016. This would ultimately lead to Warner Bros. Montreal working on another Batman game that was eventually scrapped and then made into Gotham Knights. And before you ask, no, this game is not related at all to the new Suicide Squad game that's coming out that's also set in the Arkhamverse. The Dark Knight 4. After The Dark Knight Rises was released, there were a ton of rumors about a potential fourth installment in the Dark Knight series. I mentioned the Catwoman spinoff in the last iceberg, but failed to mention how rumors were going around that a fourth installment starring Joseph Gordon-Levitt as Robin John Blake, I'm never gonna go over that, that's such a silly name, as the new Batman were going around. This ultimately never happened, which I think is for the best. Sam Hamm's Batman 2 In the early 1990s, Batman Returns was greenlit by Warner Bros. due to the massive success of Batman 89, and like any movie, it went through many different scripts. One notable script was done by Sam Hamm, the man who wrote Batman 89. This script had some similarities to what we got, like how the film was set during Christmas, there was a swarm of bats attacking the Penguin at one point, and the glider cape existed. Uh, but for the most part, it was extremely different. Some of the most major changes include Catwoman using guns and just flat out gunning people down, Dick Grayson being introduced in the film as a major character, Vicky Vale would return as the main love interest, the film centered around Penguin and Catwoman trying to steal buried treasure from the Raven Society, a very Court of Owls-like organization, the final battle takes place in Wayne Manor in the Batcave, Catwoman's cowl was a modified bondage mask and had spiked heeled boots. Catwoman is just as strong as Batman, even lifting him up into the air at one point in the film. Penguin wouldn't live in the sewers, Officer Bullock would appear in the film, and Commissioner Gordon would play a much larger role in the film. So why didn't this film happen? Well, it's actually because Tim Burton hated the script so much he fired Sam Hamm after reading it. Joker's Boner This is a really poorly aged comic panel from Batman issue 66 from 1951, where Joker is mad about how people are laughing at his boner. I don't know which one's worse. People laughing at Joker's boner, Joker threatening to make many more boners, Joker claiming the emphasis on boners gave him a new idea for a crime, or Gotham City ruining the day it mentioned boners. He also later says that Batman will make the boner of the year. So why did they use the word boner? Well, in the 1950s, boner meant something completely different. It meant a misstep or a mistake. And just to wrap this section up, Joker's plan for Batman's boner was to trick the Batplane's computer and make it land in the UK instead of California. What a classic boner. The many marriages between Batman and Catwoman. So Batman and Catwoman have gotten married, or have been close to being married, several different times throughout the decades in multiple different continuities. In Earth 2, Batman and Catwoman were officially married in Superman Family issue 211 in October 1981. Though this is just when we see them getting married. We actually learned that they were married in DC Superstars, released in December 1977. And they even had a kid together named Helena Wayne, who became Earth 2's Huntress. Sadly, this marriage would end in tragedy as Catwoman was murdered by a random criminal who used to work with her. In a possible future shot off in Batman Annual 2 in January 2018, we see Bruce and Selina have gotten married and have grown old together, though Bruce would later develop a terminal disease and pass away. In this continuity, they also had a daughter named Helena Wayne. In Earth 2, no, no, this, this is a different Earth 2. Catwoman and Batman were married once again, and once again, had Helena. We don't actually see them get married, but we know they were married. And we also know this marriage didn't end very well, as Batman is killed off in Earth 2 issue 1 in July 2012, and Catwoman is killed off in World's Finest issue 0 in November 2012. In the live-action Birds of Prey show that I talked about in the last iceberg, Catwoman and Batman were also married in that universe, and had Helena. Though in this universe, Catwoman actually had superpowers, as Helena is referred to as a half-metahuman, and these supposed powers she has are cat-related. While not confirmed if they got married, there's a very good chance that Catwoman and Batman in the Dark Knight trilogy eventually got married. I mean, the two literally retired together to start new lives outside of Gotham, so I mean, there's a good chance. In the Brave and the Bold episode, The Knights of Tomorrow, 
Alfred writes a book of how he thinks Bruce and Selina will eventually get married and have a kid named Damien. Very strange for Alfred to be writing fan fictions but his adopted son banging Catwoman. And the most recent and famous example of Batman getting married to Catwoman was in Batman issue 24 in August of 2017, where he proposed to Catwoman, and the two almost got married. It only didn't happen because in Batman issue 15 September 2018, Catwoman calls off the wedding exclusively because she realizes that Bruce would stop being Batman if they got married. Also, Nightwing and Superman bring Batman to Batburger for his bachelor party, and that's just like the funniest goddamn concept in the world. Arkham Care As part of a viral marketing campaign for Batman Arkham Asylum, a website was created called Arkham Care. This was an in-universe website modeled off the idea of Arkham Asylum having their own website. There's even safety tips on the website like, no breaking in outside items. Don't talk to people, and don't go near the freakishly huge giant humans. This website was thankfully archived in the Wayback Machine, and could even be heard mentioned in Arkham Asylum in the medical facility via the PA system. Early Calendar Man Most people nowadays agree that Calendar Man is actually a pretty cool character. Notably, his appearances in Long Halloween, and its film adaptations, and Arkham City. Also, his little cameo in The Suicide Squad was pretty funny. Hey, poke that man! I was hoping you'd entertain my kid's birthday party! You fucking pussy! Though his modern reception usually ignores his original appearances. First appearing in Detective Comics issue 259 in September 1958, Julian Day, aka The Calendar Man, would make his debut doing, what would you expect? Doing crimes on holidays. But this time, he'd wear different costumes depending on the occasion, though he did have a default Calendar Man costume. He wouldn't appear again until Batman issue 312 in June 1979, where he returns and says, I'm just going to do crimes every day of the week. And so it's a new costume reflecting of the Norse and Rowan gods. He even rocked an ultrasonic sound weapon, kind of like Lego Batman's Sonic Blaster. Ever since the long Halloween, Calendar Man has been taken much more seriously by people. Though, there are still occasional appearances where he's just a joke character. Like in the Lego Batman movie or the Suicide Squad. Arkham Knight on PC Despite some of the story decisions in Arkham Knights being not so great in my opinion, I still think it's a pretty great game that every Batman fan should play. That is, unless you're playing on PC. You see, at launch, Arkham Knight on PC was so broken that Warner Bros. had to stop selling the game as PC players literally couldn't play it because of numerous game-breaking bugs. It wouldn't be until October 28th, 2015 when the game was put back onto market, and even then there were still major technical issues. This resulted in Warner Bros. offering full refunds for the game and its season pass until the end of 2015. Gee, I wish game companies did that all the time. Their game is a buggy mess that barely works. Joker 2. What time is it? His song. Yeah. yeah. 2019's Joker was originally meant to be a standalone film that wouldn't receive many sequels, though it was supposed to start DC Black, a film series named after the DC Black label that would be an anthology of darker films based on superheroes. Outside of rumors about a House of Cards-inspired Lex Luthor film, there hasn't been any updates on these black-labeled films. Anyways, as for Joker 2, the film began development in November of 2019, and has continued into 2022, with Willem Dafoe even expressing interest in appearing in the film. There's also been talks about a solo Batman film being made set in the Joker's universe, which probably won't happen, as that would be way too confusing for general audiences. I mean, just think about it. You're not like a big Batman DC fan, but you know, you like the Batman films, and you see like the Matt Reeves Batman trilogy, but then all of a sudden like there's another Batman film being released at the same time that's also live action, that's that's not connected to Matt Reeves, but it's connected to Joker, but then it's also not connected to the DCEU. It would just be really confusing. But yes, long story short, Joker 2 is most likely happening. Burdenverse Superman Connection there's a pretty popular theory that the Burdenverse and the four Christopher Reeve Superman films, along with the spin-off film Supergirl, share the same continuity. Along with Superman Returns, I guess. This is because the cancelled Batman vs Superman film from the early 2000s was originally meant to connect these franchises, but since this film was cancelled, technically they aren't canon. Though Superman is mentioned in Batman Forever, so I take that back, maybe they are canon. Or maybe he was just referring to the Superman from Lois and Clark, The New Adventures of Superman. Now, why would he be referring to that Superman? Well, in the episode Don't Tug on Superman's Cape, you can see the Batmobile from Batman 89. So it's possible that either one of these Superman franchises could be canon to the Burdenverse. Batman Arkham How does an animated film set in the DCAU about Batman and Robin facing off against a collection of the most dangerous foes in Arkham Asylum sound? 
Pretty awesome, right? Too bad it was cancelled. Yes, this was a film that was going to happen. Titled Batman Arkham, this film was greenlit after the success of Batman and Mr. Freeze, Sub-Zero. Outside of Batman and Robin fighting criminals in Arkham Asylum, the only other plot detail we know about is that Batman was going to have a new love interest in the film. Though, ultimately, we know that relationship wouldn't go anywhere, because as everyone forgets, Batman's longest lasting romantic relationship in the DCAU wasn't with Catwoman, or the Phantasm, or even Wonder Woman, but with Batgirl. Anyways, the film was eventually cancelled for Batman Beyond Return of the Joker. And before you ask, I don't know if this film was turned into Batman Arkham Asylum. I don't think so, but I've seen some people online claim it is, so I don't know. Killer Moth. First appearing in Batman issue 63 in February of 1951, Drewy Walker, aka the Killer Moth, is an evil counterpart to Batman, who uses gadgets like a cocoon gun, a flight suit, and sonar waves to try and defeat the Cape Crusader. But yeah, he doesn't have any powers. Normally, at least, but we'll get to that. For decades, Killer Moth was treated as a joke character, with him almost always losing, with very few taking him actually seriously. Though he did once learn about Batman's true identity in Detective Comics issue 173 in July of 1951, only for him then to get brain damage caused by being shot, which caused him to get amnesia. He's also the first villain Batgirl faces in the comics, so while being a joke villain, he does have some notable appearances under his moth belt. He also has a moth signal, a mothmobile, and a moth cave. Eventually, Killer Moth would get a major redesign in Underworld Unleashed Issue 1 in November of 1995, where he'd be mutated into Charax, a giant moth monster with actual powers. This version of the character would even serve as inspiration for Killer Moth's appearance in Teen Titans. This would last up until the end of Infinite Crisis, where Killer Moth was ripped in half by Superboy Prime in Infinite Crisis Issue 7 in April 2006. In the post-New 52 world, he's returned to being a joke villain, though has occasionally been taken seriously. He's even taken seriously in the Arkhamverse, where you can see him in a tie-in comic. You can even find one of his victims in Arkham Asylum, and it's pretty grim. Joss Whedon's Batgirl Batgirl is an upcoming DCEU film that's coming out later this year, and I'm really looking forward to it, but I wasn't always looking forward to this movie. You see, the Batgirl film we're getting is not the original Batgirl film that was announced by DC and Warner Bros. back in 2017. That film was being directed, produced, and written by Joss Whedon. Now, while everyone in the world, myself included, hates Whedon, he wasn't actually fired from the project, or at least officially. Officially, he left the project in early 2018 after being unable to come up with a story for it but many people theorized that he was just fired from the project, as only like five months before he left the project, Justice League came out, and uh, that wasn't really a success. Regardless, I'm just thankful that my wife, Barbara Gordon, will thankfully not be rated by Whedon. Polka Dot Man Rising to prominence very recently in the Suicide Squad, Polka Dot Man first appeared in Detective Comics issue 300 in February of 1962, where he showed up to commit some crimes based on spots. His primary weapons are dots and spots, as he can rip them off his costume and use them as deadly weapons and other tools. And after that, his life went to shit. No, seriously, people forget that Polka Dot Man's history is actually really sad. You see, after being arrested and serving his time, he returned to Gotham City and became unemployed, despite trying to go clean. But because of his unemployment, he eventually became broke and unable to pay for anything. So, he took the crime once again and attempted to rob a jewelry store, and after hitting an officer with a bat, he was then brutally beaten almost to death by Bullock, who was sick of costumed villains at the time. And once he recovered from his injuries, he became a crippling alcoholic. He then returned to crime because of his financial problems, and joined a group of villains only for them all to be betrayed and murdered in Final Crisis Aftermath 4. Polka Dot Man didn't even get a nice death, dude's head was caved in by a manhole cover. Very recently, he was brought back into the post-New 52 world in New Year's Evil Issue 1 in February of 2020. Though this version of the character has only appeared four different times since, and could have a history a lot less sympathetic than his old one. Because of how awful his power set is, he's become one of the biggest punching bags in the DC Universe, even making joke appearances in Brave and the Bold, the Lego Batman movie, and in Justice Comics, where in the latter, he's quickly killed off by Red Hood for being quote-unquote useless. Azrael Batman During the Nightfall story arc from 1993 to 1994, Bruce was unable to be Batman because Bane broke his back, causing Bruce to become paralyzed. A man named John Paul Valley was then chosen by Bruce to be his temporary stand-in, 
John Paul Valley being more well known as Azrael. As Batman, Azrael was a little bit more brutal than Batman, flat out saying that he believes Batman should fight criminals on their terms, without care for innocent bystanders, to the point where he lets a hostage die, and after an argument, nearly strangles Tim Drake to death and bans him from the Batcave. It also doesn't exactly help that at the time he was receiving hallucinations of his dead father, who was telling him that he was the real Batman. Azrael also uses a highly advanced bat suit that he designed, and eventually after Bruce's back is fixed, Bruce decided, yeah, I got hit by this mantle, you're, you're insane. And after a lengthy fight, takes back the mantle of Batman from Azrael. Because of how unique his armor is, his bat suit has been made playable in LEGO Batman 3 Beyond Gotham and the PS3 version of Arkham Origins, even including challenge mats based on Batman Nightfall. I am so happy the era of console-exclusive DLC is over. Oh, wait, wait, right. Jingle Bells, Batman Smells. This is a take on the classic Christmas song, Jingle Bells. This variation originates back in the 1960s, with the first written version of it appearing in the January 3rd, 1967 edition of the Lawton Constitution, where it stated that a woman that came from Belgium would sing this song around Christmas time. Since then, variations of it have come and gone throughout the decades. Though it's worth noting that the original written lyrics don't actually mention Joker, Gotham and Gotham Girl. Gotham and Gotham Girl were a pair of superheroes introduced in DCU Rebirth 1 in July 2016. Unlike Batman and a majority of the Bat family, these two actually had superpowers. And not just simple powers either, I'm talking Superman level powers. They didn't get these powers by normal means though, or as normal as you can get superpowers, but instead they bought these powers at a cost. The powers are directly tied to their life force, so whenever Gotham or Gotham Girl use their powers, they shorten their lifespans. But I guess Henry Clover Jr., aka Gotham, doesn't have to worry about that anymore, because he died in Batman issue 65 in April 2019, after going on a murderous rampage after losing his parents. And this only happened because he took off his mask, and a criminal saw his face and was like, I'm gonna kill your parents. And I guess Claire Clover, aka Gotham Girl, doesn't have to worry about this anymore either, as in Batman issue 85, released in December 2019, Batman cured her condition by exposing her to, to platinum kryptonite. I should also mention here that Bane and Psycho Pirate manipulated her to join Bane's side and help take over Gotham, but Batman would eventually free her from his control. Deleted Scenes So there's been a ton of Batman films and films related to Batman characters released over the years. And since every single movie out there has deleted scenes, of course there's deleted scenes for these Batman films. So here's a small collection of deleted scenes from each of these films. These aren't all of them, obviously, just the ones I found the most interesting. Also, for films like Batman v Superman, Justice League, and The Suicide Squad, etc., I'll only be talking about deleted scenes that have something to do with Batman himself or characters that are related to him. The deleted scenes in Batman 89 include a scene in which Bob had a one-on-one -on -one fight with Batman, a scene in which Batman saves a little girl in an alleyway, a scene in which Joker pushes Carl Grimson's lifeless body from a chair, a scene in which Vicky Vale stumbles upon two kids dressed up as Batman, and most famously, a scene in which Batman borrows a police officer's horse to chase after Joker in a dynamite truck, which results in Dick Grayson's parents being killed. Grayson would then be saved by Batman and wouldn't show up for the rest of the film. The deleted scenes in Batman Returns include an alternate opening to the film in which a Batman merch shop was destroyed by the fire-breathing goon seen in the film, a scene in which penguin thugs light civilians on fire was cut, this scene was cut so the film could get a PG-13 rating. And finally, after Catwoman shocks a thug with a stun gun, she would originally say, Electro shock therapy? What a bargain. In Batman Forever, the deleted scenes include the film having a darker opening where a doctor in Arkham Asylum would walk into Two-Face's cell, only to find a guard tied up with a message reading, The Bat Must Die on the wall. Batman accidentally enters a beauty salon, in which everyone there laughs at him. An entire subplot was cut for the film, in which Bruce blamed himself for the death of his parents. A scene in which Bruce gets his alternate Batman costume seen in the third act of the movie. There was a scene in which a giant bat flies up to Bruce. And the film had an alternate ending, in which Batman and Robin would stand at a gargoyle together, as the film came to a close. In Batman and Robin, there was an entire subplot cut for the film, in which Bruce and Alfred do research into Poison Ivy's backstory, where the two discover her secret identity. There was a scene in which Batman's arctic suit repels Freeze's ice gun, this scene actually made it into the comic adaptation. And finally, there's a scene in which it's revealed that Barbara isn't actually Alfred's niece, 
and Alfred mentions visiting Metropolis. In Catwoman, there is a scene in which Catwoman is chased by dogs in a junkyard that was scrapped. There is also another romance scene between Catwoman and Tom, an alternate version of Catwoman and Laurel's first fight, a scene in which Catwoman paints a cat mural, and a scene in which Laurel and Catwoman talk in front of a mirror. Riveting stuff. In Batman Begins, there's a scene in which Bruce disguises himself as a homeless person to take photos of Judge Fadden. And there's also a scene in which Batman crouches like a gargoyle on a building. In The Dark Knight, there's a scene in which Joker escapes Bruce's penthouse. Right before the bank robbery, Joker gives an old woman $100 and tells her to walk away or keep silence about seeing him. Rachel's last words were originally, Bruce, Harvey, I love you. And Harvey Dent's backstory on how he met Rachel was cut. The deleted scenes of The Dark Knight Rises include a scene in which Talia al Ghul in The Tumblr runs over Commissioner Foley, which kills him. This scene would have actually given the film an R rating and had to be cut. We also would have seen Bane's entire origin story in the film. In Batman v Superman, Dawn of Justice, most of the film's deleted scenes were added back into the film with the ultimate edition. Some of these scenes include a scene in which Alfred angrily chops wood, and the scene in which Batman and Luther talk in prison is greatly extended. In Suicide Squad, a scene was cut where Harley Quinn is arrested by Batman, who explains that she'll be going to Belle Reve for the murder of Robin. Monster T endgames himself after realizing that Joker was going to torture him to death. A scene in which Joker's damage tattoo and teeth were explained, but was cut. It was going to be revealed that Batman broke Joker's teeth, and the damage tattoo serves as a reminder to Batman about how he lost control when he killed Robin. And there was also a scene in which Harley Quinn and Deadshot kiss. In Justice League, the fight between Batman and the Parademon at the beginning of the movie was originally a lot longer and a lot more comedic. As for Joker, not many of the deleted scenes have been revealed. This is because Todd Phillips hates deleted scenes. Two of the ones that we know about are one involving Sophie reacting to the Joker killing Murray on TV after Joker sends her a letter telling her to watch the Murray Franklin show that night, and a scene just known as the bathtub scene that was apparently way too extreme for an R rating. Todd Phillips has claimed the scene wasn't pornographic or anything, it was just insane. In Birds of Prey, there was a scene in which Harley Quinn is literally kicked out of Joker's house. The deleted scenes in the Snyder Cut include Batman discovering a room in which humans are being turned into parademons, a 30 minute long military subplot was cut from the film, and originally Ryan Reynolds would have reprised his role as Hal Jordan and would appear at the end of the film talking with Bruce, but DC was like, no, 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 no. So Zack Snyder then went with Jon Stewart, but DC again was like, no, uh, we actually have plans for Jon Stewart, you can't use him. So ultimately, he ended up using Martian Manhunter. And finally, in The Suicide Squad, a scene in which Harley Quinn and Javelin talk about Harley Quinn's bowel movements was cut, and a scene in which Thinker tries to convince Polka Dot Man to join him was cut. He ultimately refuses and shoots the Thinker's ear. <laughs> Taco Bell presents Nacho and Dog. Hey, Notch, how about another tasty taco? No problemo, man. <laughs> Hold it! Another bag! Ooh, that was close. Now you can get one of five super cool Batman toys when you buy a Taco Bell kids meal. Like the portable bat signal, you can collect all five Batman toys only at Taco Bell. That's that food. Bong! Ah! <laughs> you are watching Batman on Cartoon Network. Batman Shoots a Vampire In Detective Comics issue 32, released in August 1939, Batman battled the Mad Monk, a vampire with an insanely long list of powers. But all you really need to know is that he's a vampire, or a vampire-werewolf hybrid thing that was later retconned as just being a vampire? Look, this comic was released before World War II began, what do you want from it? Anyways, after battling a bunch of wolves that were summoned by the Bad Monk, Batman tracks him down along with another vampire named Dala, and finds them both sleeping in coffins, and Batman's just like, nah, I'm done with this shit. He then puts silver bullets into his trusty, iconic handgun and kills them both in their sleep. Robin 3000 
Robin 3000 is an Elseworlds story released in 1993 that ran for two issues. Originally meant to be about a futuristic version of Tom Swift, a classic science fiction hero, the story was turned into a DC story after the company that requested this Tom Swift story being made, Simon & Schuster, decided not to enter the graphic novel market. And so after a few years, Brian Press and P. Craig Russell decided to give the story to DC, where they do some work to make it a futuristic Batman story. Anyways, Robin 3000 tells the story of Thomas Wayne, the Robin of the 31st century, who, after his uncle Bruce Wayne XX is murdered by an invading alien species, takes up the mantle of Robin and goes out to defeat the aliens. But he's got some friends to help him out, like the Robin android built by Batman, a group of rebels, and a mercenary who turns on the aliens. Together, they defeat the invading alien army known as the Sculpts, and they create a new Batman with some DNA the android had. I should also take the time here to mention that uh, Bruce Wayne XX's father in this universe is named Bruce Wayne XIX. This Elseworld universe hasn't really been revisited at all since its release, and has been kind of forgotten at the time. Prometheus and Arkham Knight In the Seasons of Infamy DLC for Batman Arkham Knight, there were originally going to be six villains for Batman to face off against. In the DLC we got, we had Killer Croc, Mr. Freeze, Mad Hatter, and Ra's al Ghul. The two scrapped villains were Black Mask and Prometheus. Black Mask would still make it into the game, only to die in a pre-order DLC that spoiled the twist of the main game, but Prometheus never made it into the game. We only know that he was meant to be in the game because data miners were able to find mentions to him in the game's text files. The many times villains pretended to be Batman. There's been several different times in which some of Batman's villains decided to do a bit of cosplay as the Dark Knight. In Detective Comics issue 472, released in June of 1977, Hugo Strange takes a swing at being Batman, or more accurately, Bruce Wayne, in an attempt at taking over the Wayne Foundation. Though he does goof around a bit in the Bat Super Fun, ultimately his plan fails and Bruce returns to being Batman thanks to Robin rescuing him and Alfred while Hugo Strange is arrested. In Outsiders issue 22, released in March 2005, Deathstroke pretends to be Batman in order to trick Arsenal into trusting him. He does this by feeding him information on criminal activity, but Arsenal figures out Deathstroke's actually Batman and the two battle it out. In Batman issue 643, released in August 2005, two in one year, huh? Black Mask pretends to be Batman and even fights Joker as Batman. That is, until the real Batman shows up and defeats both of them, though Black Mask is able to get away. So why did Black Mask pretend to be Batman? Well, to frame Batman for murder, as at this time, Batman was facing some pretty negative publicity, and Black Mask wanted to make it ten times worse. And finally, we have Bane, who in Forever Evil Arkham War issue 6, released in March of 2014, dressed up as Batman, but not to pretend to be him. Instead, Bane created his own bat suit and used it to battle many different criminals in Arkham, as at the time, Scarecrow had taken control of the prison, and Bane had to take him out, because he wanted Gotham for himself and realized that Scarecrow and his army would portion up the city for themselves. Basically, him wearing the bat suit was like a symbolism thing or something. He knew the criminals feared Batman, so he was just like, I'll wear this outfit to scare them. But like, in all fairness, I think the criminals would probably just be as scared, if not more, if it was just like Bane walking in. Gods and Monsters Gods and Monsters is an alternate universe in which the DC Universe is flipped on its head. Superman is the son of Zod, Wonder Woman is a new Genesis exile, and Batman is a vampire. Created by Bruce Timm and Alan Burnett for the 2015 film Justice League Gods and Monsters, in this universe, Batman isn't Bruce Wayne, and is instead Kirk Langstrom. He became a vampire after trying to cure his cancer because the serum he created to cure this cancer used the saliva of a vampire bat to break down the tumor. This somehow turned him into a vampire because comic logic, and for a while he just kind of survived sucking the blood off of rats in the streets until he was eventually found by Superman, and then the two of them, along with Wonder Woman, would create the Justice League. Now as Batman, he doesn't actually have a problem with killing criminals. In fact, we actually see him kill Harley Quinn in a prequel short titled Twisted. And uh, yeah, this is probably the worst looking Harley Quinn, period. Outside of the movie, this single short, and his own one-shot comic tie-in, this version of Batman has never appeared in anything. Arrowverse Bane. In the Arrowverse, Bane has been hinted at existing several different times, most notably in the Batwoman episode, Kane Kate, 
where we see Kane stealing Batman's trophies, including Bane's Venom. But that's not all. In the Arrow episode, Elseworlds Part 2, you can see Bane's mask from the Dark Knight Rises inside of a storage room in Arkham Asylum. So I guess the Arrowverse Bane is a combination between the classic Venom Bane and the Dark Knight Rises Bane. Lego Zodiac Killer. So this is a really simple one that's 100% me just overthinking things. You see, the Riddler and the Batman was inspired by the Zodiac Killer. And since there's now a Lego figure of the Riddler from the Batman, you could technically say there's now a Lego Zodiac Killer minifigure. Or a Lego figure based on the Zodiac Killer. Look, I, I, I just thought it was funny, so I put it in the iceberg. Secret Arkham Asylum Room In one of the most impressively hidden Easter eggs in the last two decades of games, if you blow up one of the walls in the Warden's office, you'll uncover a short tunnel that leads to a secret room filled with blueprints for Arkham City. This easter egg was so well hidden that the developers actually had to come out and announce where it was. Batman Dark Joker The Wild Batman Dark Joker The Wilds is an Elseworlds story written by Doug Monch, released in January of 1994. In this universe, Batman is the child of two sorcerers who created him to defeat Dark Joker in medieval times. But he's no ordinary human. In fact, he's not human at all. He's a monster that grew up alone in the wilderness fighting animals. This is because almost immediately after he was born, Dark Joker decided to murder his sorcerer parents. And just like how Batman is incredibly different in this universe, so is the Joker. As in this universe, he's a dark sorcerer that makes shrunken heads and leads a demon army. Eventually, this Batman and his newly discovered sister would decide to take the Dark Joker down. But his sister was killed during her first fight with the Joker, and so Batman, filled with rage, along with the rest of the townsfolk, joined forces to battle Dark Joker and his demonic army. And after a brutal fight, Batman throws Dark Joker down to his death, but not before ripping out Dark Joker's throat for good measure. This universe hasn't really been touched on since its release, most likely because, at least from the reviews I've seen, most people didn't really like the story. Double Helix Justice League To tie in with George Miller's Justice League Mortal film that I talked about in the last Batman Iceberg, Double Helix were hired to create a Justice League video game titled Justice League Arcade. It was meant to be released for the Xbox 360 in the late 2000s. The game had you choose to play as either Batman, The Flash, Superman, Wonder Woman, or Green Lantern, which would lead you to traveling around the DC Universe to battle villains. The story had the Justice League battling Mongol, who was leading a group of villains that consisted of Bane, Lady Shiva, Sinestro, Cyborg Superman, Solomon Grundy, Reverse Flash, Eclipso, Bizarro, and General Zod. Yeah, kind of a weird rogue gallery. I mean, no Joker, no Lex Luthor, no Ares, no Black Adam. Just kind of odd. There are also a number of different costumes to unlock in the game. As for Batman, as this is a Batman iceberg, you can get his classic outfit, the Shade Batman skin, the bat Zaro skin, and the Justice Armor skin. Anyways, what's notable about this game is that it's done. It's finished. You can actually play the entire game right now. Well, if you can get access to it. You see, the only known finished copy is in the hands of a YouTuber named Proto, who was able to get access to the spill because in his own words, well this, basically he knows some guys and that's it. I guess I should also say that technically it's not finished, there's still a lot of bugs and stuff, but for the most part it's done. He even has an entire series replaced the entire story mode, so I'll link that in the description below, along with an Unseen 64 video on the topic. So why was this game cancelled? Well you're gonna get mad. It's because Justice League Mortal is cancelled, and so Warner Bros. ordered for this game to be cancelled along with it. Despite the game not being connected at all to Justice League Mortal, it was just being released around the same time as Mortal to generate hype. But it gets worse. Many of the game's ideas would later be carried over to Double Helix's next DC game. Green Lantern Rise of the Manhunters. You're finished, Ammon! I will not let you win! Is it over? What now? Robin dreams about Batman getting married. In Batman issue 122, released in March 1959, Batman and Batwoman get married. To which Robin's first thought is, 
Oh boy, I, I sure hope I don't get fired. In the story, Batman reveals his identity to her, and uh, everything's cool, you know, she's cool with it, she's, you know, she's part of the crew. Except it's actually not, as literally a day later, Batman hides her costume and gear and tells Kathy Kane that one crime fighter is enough. Despite Robin also being there, so it's kind of just like, the woman should stay home or whatever, so it's... It was, it was the 1950s. She doesn't listen and shows up to the fight in a new bat suit, where she gets her mask taken off and the whole world discovers her identity and bruises because she calls Batman darling. Robin then starts screaming at her, telling you that she's ruined Batman, to which Batman then starts violently shaking Robin, telling him to stop it. And then it's all revealed in the final pages that it was all just a dream. Luke Oliver. Luke Oliver is a very minor character in Orkham Asylum, who appears in a cell next to Clayface's cell. So, what's so special about him? Well, his face is modeled after Luke Oliver, the winner of a contest held in 2008 to have their face rendered in Arkham Asylum. But Rocksteady went a bit further and even had his name listed on Joker's party list, despite him not actually being released from his cell, so... I guess he wasn't, like, a top priority invite. The Eraser Lenny Fiasco, aka The Eraser, was a supervillain who dressed up like a pencil with an eraser helmet. He did this to remind himself every day about how he constantly failed in high school. Which, uh, side note, he was actually a classmate of Bruce Wayne's. He also dresses like this, as it's a little reference to how he was usually hired to fight criminals to erase every trace of evidence left at crime scenes. First appearing in Batman issue 188, released in December of 1966, he didn't really do much, as after being defeated by Batman and Robin, he just kind of disappeared from the comics. In fact, in this continuity, he only made, like, three more appearances. And all these appearances happened roughly 50 years after his initial appearance. He made his return in Babin issue 682, released in November of 2008, though it was just a hallucination. He actually made his return in Babin issue 686, released in February 2009, where uh, he did nothing. And uh, that was it. That was it. He has made a return in the post-New 52 world in Batman Annual 1, released in January 2017, and instead of dressing up as a pencil in this universe, his head just looks like an eraser. Man can't catch a break. He's also made appearances in Brave and the Bold in the Lego Batman movie, because, I mean, look at him, I mean, he's kind of goofy. Bat Mummy. In Detective Comics issue 320, released in October of 1963, Batman and Robin take to the streets to fight crime disguised as mummies. Why? Well, the pair were hit by an alien device that turned their skin green, so they dressed up as mummies to conceal their secret identities while fighting crime. And Vicky Vale during this entire thing is just kind of like, okay, so they're probably Bruce Wayne and Dick Grayson. But then they show up again with no green skin, revealing that the device's effects have worn off. So she's just like, oh, okay, so it must not be Bruce Wayne and Dick Grayson. I love how Bruce Wayne's first thought after his skin getting turned green was to dress up as a mummy and not just, like, create a bat suit that covers his mouth. Batman the Widening Gyre Batman the Widening Gyre is a sequel series to the three-issue miniseries Batman Cacophony. Released from 2009 to 2010, this story, along with Cacophony, was written by Kevin Smith and tells the story of Batman battling the villain Automatopoeia. Or, it would be. You see, the comic ran for six issues, but it was originally meant to go for 12 issues. And because of its cancellation midway through, Onomatopoeia being revealed as the villain is quite literally the last panel of the series. Though he is a main character in the story, as he disguises himself as the hero, Baphomet, who wears a wooden goat mask and wields a crossbow. Oh, and in this story, Babbitt unmasks himself to propose to a woman named Silver St. Cloud, a character that was, like, introduced to the comics, like, 40 years ago, but whatever. And after she's like, oh, yeah, I'll marry you, Bruce. He he then tracks her down uh, and rips out one of her hairs to run a DNA test on her to make sure she's human. Yeah, the man's a little paranoid, a little, little aggressively paranoid. Also, Catwoman throughout this entire comic is really out of character, and she's just kind of like, well, I thought we were a thing. I, I thought, what? And Batman's like, Sorry, I guess, lol. It's really weird. She even hires Deadshot to pretend to fight her to, like, draw him out so that she can talk to him. It's... It's really fucking bizarre. It's a really weird story, not just for these reasons, but also because the comic is filled to the brim with Kevin Smith's crude humor. For example, there's a scene in which Batman confesses to Baphomet that 
during the iconic none of you are safe speech from Batman Year One, one of like the best Batman moments ever, uh, he pissed himself because of the heat. Ultimately, the second half of the comic would never happen as Kevin Smith was just too busy with comic book men. And uh, honestly, that's probably for the best. Batman Demon, a tragedy. Batman Demon, a tragedy is an Elseworld story released in April 2000, written by Alan Grant with art being done by Jim Murray. It's a story about Bruce Wayne battling a demon who's slaughtering criminals. This demon gets the attention of Killer Croc as his men get slaughtered, so he hires Catwoman, who has sold her soul to the devil, to kill whoever is killing his men. It's then revealed that Bruce Wayne isn't just fighting a demon, he's a cage that the demon's trapped in. Alfred explains to Bruce that Bruce Wayne is just a cage for a bat demon named Etrigan. This happened because over a thousand years ago, Gotham was under attack by Metropolis, and so Merlin, yes the wizard, saved Gotham by summoning a demon named Etrigan. And after defeating Metropolis, they were like, All right, Etrigan, can you go back to hell? And he was like, No, I mean, I'd like to, but I was actually banned from hell for being too evil. And so they contained Etrigan by having one of the city council members named Bruce Wayne become the host of the demon, which allowed Bruce to become immortal. And then Alfred's like, By the way, I'm actually Merlin, and I give you fake memories of your parents being murdered. S sorry about that. And then Bruce declares he'll kill Etrigan. And this doesn't go very well, as Etrigan brutally murders Catwoman, Poison Ivy, and Killer Croc, and is about to kill Bruce's girlfriend, Glenda. So Bruce orders Merlin to cast the Forgetfulness spell, which is apparently the only way to save her. And the comic ends with Bruce discovering that Killer Croc, Catwoman, Commissioner Gordon, and Glenda were murdered. Which, yes, means the spell didn't work. So it's a bad ending where the demon still exists, and everybody but Bruce and Alfred die. The art of the comic is also very interesting. It's... It's got a unique charm to it. Overall, it's a comic that I actually recommend you check out, just for how bizarre it is. Legionary. When I talked with the Batman of All Nations earlier in the video, I left out a single member that I thought deserved his own spot in the iceberg. Legionary, the Batman of Italy. First appearing in Detective Comics issue 215 in January of 1955, Legionary shows up as a member of the Club of Heroes, who took inspiration from Batman and the Holy Roman Empire. He fought crime for a while, armed with a spear and ancient Roman armor, until eventually he was bought off by criminals in Rome, which led to him basically giving up and becoming really fat. And that's just how he was for a while, until Batman issue 667 in August 2007, where he was stabbed 33 times by Wingman, just as Julius Caesar died. He's probably one of the most pathetic Batman out there. Though he did have one redeeming quality, in the post-New 52 world, while he doesn't appear, as he apparently died in this universe, he did have a daughter who took up the mantle and became part of Batman Incorporated. Bruce Wayne, Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. So Dark Claw wasn't the only Marvel DC combination character for Batman. In April 1996, the first and only issue of Bruce Wayne, Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. was released, which saw Bruce Wayne and Nick Fury being combined, although Nick Fury still exists in this universe, so I don't know how that works. He battles criminals alongside Black Bat, aka Black Cat and Batgirl combined, and Moonwing, aka Nightwing and Moon Knight combined. And in this comic in particular, they battle the forces of Hydra, led by Green Skull, aka Red Skull and Lex Luthor combined, Madam Cat, aka Catwoman and Supreme Hydra combined, and Deathlock, aka Jason Todd, Midnight, and Deathlock combined. Bill Murray Batman there was a scrapped Batman film titled The Batman, set for release in 1985, that would have brought the character back to the screen, starring Bill Murray. But when the film was pitched to studios, they all declined, until they eventually met with Warner Bros. who picked up the film. The film was inspired a lot by Batman's strange apparitions from the 1970s, and would have been an attempt at Warner Bros. in DC to make the public care about Batman again, as at the time, unless you were a comic reader, you'd only know Batman from the Adam West show or the serials from the 1940s. Anyways, as for the plot of the film, it would have had the Cape Crusader battling Joker, who, like in the 1989 film, was responsible for Bruce Wayne's parents' murder. Though, in this version, he didn't kill them directly. In this film, he hired Joe Chill to do it, and then murders Joe Chill himself. Joker would also be responsible for Robin's origin, as he'd have his parents killed. The final battle of the film would take place in an art museum that's doing a special exhibit on writing, which leads to Batman and Joker fighting, surrounded by giant pencils, pens, erasers, etc. There's also a giant typewriter that Batman gets trapped in. 
And also, Batman uses a giant rubber band to launch a giant thumbtack into Rupert Thorne, which would lead to Rupert Thorne backing into a giant pencil sharpener that would grind him into paste. As for other plot details, there's a lot to go over, like how Bruce was a child genius who created fully functioning holograms, Penguin would have been the secondary antagonist of the film, and would have battled Batman using his umbrella that doubled as a personal helicopter, Silver St. Cloud would have been the main love interest and slowly would have figured out Bruce was Batman, Penguin's goons wore jetpacks to battle Batman, Rupert Thorne would be one of the film's antagonists, and would be supported by Joker in a scheme that lasted 20 years to get Thorne to power. And finally, Silver St. Cloud dies after Thorne shoots her. So who'd star in this film, outside of Bill Murray? Well, for Joker, David Bowie was up for consideration. And as for Robin, the studio was considering either Michael J. Fox or Eddie Murphy. Ultimately, the film would be cancelled, only because Tim Burton was assigned to direct the film, and he hated the script. So he had the film be completely rewritten, and well, that's how we got Batman 1989. Batman Fights a Christmas Tree in Batman issue 285, released in March 1977, Batman had quite the Christmas adventure when the villain Dr. Zinzin escaped from prison and used his powers to trick people into believing that the Gotham City Christmas tree was on fire. So Batman shows up to the event, and suddenly a bear jumps out of the tree and starts to maul him. But then the tree itself grabs onto Batman, wrapping him up in its branches. Zinzin then frees Batman from the Christmas tree and makes the bear disappear. That's when Batman realizes Zinzin's true plan. Zin Zin is robbing Gotham City of its Christmas spirit by using his powers to make everyone forget it's Christmas Eve. Batman then tricks Zin Zin into thinking he's forgotten it's Christmas as well, and so Zin Zin's like, okay, I guess I'll explain my plan to him, which allows Batman to foil his plans and save Christmas. Crazy Quilt. First appearing in Batman issue 316 in October of 1979, Paul Decker took up the mantle of Crazy Quilt after being betrayed by one of his henchmen which led to him being blinded by a gunshot. While in prison, he volunteered for an experimental procedure that restore his vision with a special helmet that was fused to his optic nerves. It worked, but it also drove him insane as, while he could see, the colors were so blindingly vivid and disorienting that he just went insane. And so he started committing crimes as Crazy Quilt. And as Crazy Quilt, he could manipulate color, fire off energy beams, and could even hypnotize people. After battling Batman and Robin several times, he eventually grew to have an obsession with Robin as he was just so angry that he was beaten by a kid. This obsession eventually led to him beating Jason Todd almost to death because he confused him for Dick Grayson in Batman issue 368 in February of 1984, which was also Jason Todd's first appearance as Robin. Jason Todd just can't catch a break, can he? Since then, he's become a minor reoccurring villain that's even showed up in the post-New 52 world starting in Harley Quinn issue 36 in March 2018. But you know what's really weird? This crazy quilt that I've been talking about wasn't the first crazy quilt. The first was a man whose name we don't actually know, who first appeared in Boy Commandos issue 15 in June 1946. He'd show up a few times before never showing up again after Star Spangled Comics issue 123 in December of 1951, and his existence would be erased during Crisis on Infinite Earths. The Science of Batman The Science of Batman is a college course available at the University of Victoria in Canada, where students can learn about how the human body can be adapted and improved based on the metaphor of the Cape Crusader. So, yes, there's a Batman college course. Batman in Teen Titans While the TV series Teen Titans is primarily about the titular group, Batman himself, well, never shows up. He's indirectly mentioned in the episode Haunted, but... But his only appearance in the Teen Titans continuity is in Teen Titans Go. No, not that show. The original Teen Titans Go was a comic series that served as a companion comic to the cartoon, and was actually canon. Batman himself shows up in Teen Titans Go issue 47, where he's shown spying on his son, making out with Starfire. Kinda weird, Bruce. Kinda weird. Batman 89 Batman 89 is a limited comic series written by Sam Hamm that continues the events of the Burdenverse. Kinda. It takes place after Batman Returns and splits off in the timeline so that Batman Forever and Batman and Robin don't happen. It's still going on, so I won't talk too much about the plot, as not to spoil too much, but the comic sees Billy Dee Williams' Harvey Dent become Two-Face and has a more Tim Burton-inspired Robin and Barbara Gordon being introduced. Catwoman also returns to the comic, and Bullock is finally introduced into the Burdenverse. 
Also, the criminals of Gotham are all dressing up like Batman and Joker, kind of like Gotham City imposters. As for the rest of the plot, I'll let you check out this comic for yourself. And before you ask, yeah, I think this comic is going to be retconned out of existence with the Flash movie. Or maybe not, I don't know. Batman Haunted Gotham Batman Haunted Gotham is a four-issue limited series that was released in the year 2000, created by Doug Munch and Kelly Jones. This is set in an alternate universe where Batman faces off against the Joker, who, in this universe, is a Frankenstein-like creation that contains the soul of an evil mad scientist and the head of Thomas Wayne. So, uh, not your normal Joker. He also battles werewolves, skeletons, zombies, demons, ghosts, and Ophidin, a demon space snake cult leader that abducts people and sacrifices them to his alien snake god. Did I also mention that Thomas and Martha Wayne are murdered by a werewolf in this continuity? And Batman later flat out executes that werewolf? They also die when Bruce is an adult, and both have been training him all his life so that he can one day battle the demonic forces haunting Gotham. Batman's also helped by Catherine Magic, aka Cat Magic, who's a fortune teller with magical powers. Overall, it's a pretty crazy universe where Batman's foes are nearly all undead monsters that he has no issue with killing. Clue Master Clue Master is a Batman villain who first appeared in Detective Comics issue 351 in May of 1966. His real name is Arthur Brown, and he's a rather weird villain who's often confused with Joker and the Riddler, as his whole thing is committing crimes and then leaving behind clues and puzzles for people to solve in order to find him. He only did this because he had OCD. No, really, that's the uh, explanation they gave. This variant of OCD forced him to leave clues at the scenes of all of his crimes. And as for his powers, he didn't have any. Though he does have little glass pellets on his costume that he can throw as weapons. These pellets usually contain either smoke bombs, incinerary flares, paralyzing gas, or explosives. While a supervillain, he did try and leave a life of crime behind early in his career, where he joined the superhero team Justice League Antarctica. This didn't last very long, though. Though eventually Clue Master would be cured of his OCD somehow, and was released from prison, he decided to celebrate this by committing more crimes, where he'd eventually be captured by Spoiler. Which, uh, by the way, Spoiler, aka Stephanie Brown, is actually his daughter, and is pretty much his biggest contribution to the DC Universe. He would later make his way into the post-New 52 universe, where he's continued being a recurring villain in the DC Universe. And unlike a lot of the weird villains I've talked about in this iceberg so far, he's actually taken relatively seriously still in the DC Universe. He's appeared in other forms of media as well, as he's shown up in Brave and the Bold, the Batman cartoon, and even the Arrowverse. Batman Man-Bat Batman Man-Bat is an Elseworlds story about, well, who else? Batman and Man-Bat. In this three-issue miniseries, Batman battles against Man-Bat, who is trying to unleash a plague that will turn all of humanity into bat-like monsters. He wants to do this after witnessing how humanity is destroying the environment. And so his natural response is, I'll just create a new species that will overtake humanity. Batman Man-Bat is an extremely graphic and brutal take on both Batman and Man-Bat that's filled to the brim with morally great characters. It's also just, like, really disgusting at times, though the art is really great. Overall, it's a very sadly obscure Elseworld story that's a must-read if you're a Man-Bat fan. Batman Digital Justice Batman Digital Justice is an Elseworld story, well, it's not technically an Elseworld story, but let's be real here, it's an Elseworld story, released in February of 1990, that you can tell was made when the internet was just becoming a big thing. Written by Pepe Moreno and Doug Murray, with RP done by the former and Bob Fingerman, Digital Justice takes place at the end of the 21st century, where the world is dominated by technology. Batman, Commissioner Gordon, and Alfred are all long since dead, and the story focuses on James Gordon, the grandson of Commissioner Gordon. This new Gordon becomes his era's Batman in order to free Gotham City from a sentient computer virus created by the Joker, because I guess in this world Joker was an expert with computers. But he doesn't battle the virus alone, he's got Robert Chang, a street punk who's become Robin, and Shalia Romero, a pop star who's become Catwoman. Oh, and there's also the Alfred bot. The Joker virus isn't the only foe they have to face. There's Madame X, who's the mayor of Gotham City, who is working together with the virus. 
Oh, there's also neo neo Nazis. Just uh, just screw it around. Together, they defeat the Joker virus and Madame X and save the day. I mean, they don't like really. The city is still in a state of dystopia, but uh, hey, the Joker the Joker virus is destroyed. So as is that. Digital Justice was a really weird comic that was created entirely with computers. Yeah, all the art in this comic was made digitally. Side note, Catwoman's design in this is very clearly inspired by the Machine Man from the 1927 film Metropolis. The Snowman The Snowman is a Batman villain that first appeared in Batman issue 337 in July of 1981. And is a Yeti. Uh, and that's kind of it. I mean, he's just a Yeti. Or a, a half Yeti. You see, Klaus Christian, a.k.a. the Snowman, was born from a rather strange relationship. His mom was human, while his dad was a yeti, and so he was born albino with the ability to transform himself into a yeti-like monster. I should also mention here that his mom didn't know that she was banging a yeti. Like, she was lost in the Himalayas and was saved by a yeti, but it was so dark she couldn't tell it was human. But she was like, I'm gonna bang my savior anyways in this icy cave. And she somehow didn't, like, feel all the fur. And so when she found out it was a Yeti, she just had, like, a mental breakdown. You can only say the word Yeti until the day she died. Anyways, why did Klaus become a villain? Well, he needed money to travel around the world, looking for a perfect cold place to live. And so he began robbing places in Gotham City. Batman would then track him down to Austria, where they'd fight, and he'd fall off a cliff, where he'd eventually realize that his half-human, half-Yeti condition was killing him. So he tracked down his dad and just lived out the rest of his days in peace in Detective Comics issue 522 in January of 1983. Since his death, there's been other villains called the Snowman or the Yeti, but there's only been one other version of Klaus, who's appeared in the DCAU, appearing briefly in Justice League Adventures issue 12 in December of 2002. The Dark Knight ARG In promotion for The Dark Knight, Warner Bros. created an ARG viral marketing campaign to promote the film. Starting in July 2007 at that year's San Diego Comic Con, Fake currency was thrown out. These dollars were all created by the Joker, and on these dollars was a link to a website, whysoserious.com. Going there would enter you into a game where you'd be thrown into the world of Gotham City, and be given rewards by solving puzzles and doing tasks, like picking up cakes from local bakeries that had a Nokia Joker phone inside them. Some of the rewards were audio from characters from the film, with the film's actors even reprising their roles, and the first ever image of Heath Ledger's Joker. It was one of the first major ARG promotional campaigns and is still looked back at and is still looked at as one of the best all these years later. Batman and Planetary. Batman and Planetary is a one-shot comic released in June 2003 written by Warren Ellis about the team Planetary, who are characters from Wildstorm Comics, traveling to Gotham City looking for a dude named John Black. And while they find him, they eventually come across Batman. Now, since neither party knows who each other are, they start to fight. And that's when it's revealed that this dude named John Black has some genetic enhancements. These enhancements allow him to generate multi-dimensional fields, which rewrite reality. When he uses this power, multiple Batman from across the multiverse get transported in, who all want to arrest Black. These Batman include the Adam West Batman, the Dark Knight Returns Batman, Earth-1 Batman, and Earth-2 Batman. Eventually, Black is defeated after he and Batman both discover that their parents were both killed by murderers. After that, the Planetary take Black away, and they never interact with Batman ever again. Batman The World Batman The World is a collection of one-shots released in September 2021. Written by an insane amount of people, Batman The World's stories are all written by people from different parts of the globe. From Russia, Mexico, Italy, Japan, France, South Korea, China, Spain, Turkey, etc. Each comic has their own art style and tone, which leads to the comic being a celebration of pretty much every kind of Batman story. I won't dive into each story as that'd take too long, and it just came out less than a year ago, so I don't really want to spoil it for you. I guess I should mention something, though. Um, there's Panda Girl. Panda Girl's a thing now. Hmm, probably my imagination. Probably not. Magnificent. I suggest you save the flattery for the judge, Catwoman. Next time on Batman. OnStar now offers voice access to internet news, stocks, and email. Riddler. Virtual advisor. Get email. Riddle me this. What do a river and money have in common? 
the bank. Get my business news. Gotham City Bank closed early today for its stockholders' dinner. It's payday, boys! Not today. Get it! <laughs> Voice activated internet service from OnStar. Arkham Knight cameos. In Arkham Knight, there's a bunch of cameos from characters from previous Arkham games or just other DC characters. For example, in Wayne Tower, you can hear a voicemail left by Lex Luthor, who's trying to buy Wayne Enterprises' Applied Sciences Division. In the final cutscene of the game, you can briefly see Calendar Man standing outside of Wayne Manor, as he plans to kill Batman on Halloween. While looking through recordings while trying to find Barbara after she's kidnapped, you can briefly see Victor Zaz. And finally, in Batgirl Matter of Family, you can find Starro hidden away in captivity in a secret room. Booster Gold in The Killing Joke In Booster Gold Volume 2, Issue 5, released in February 2008, Booster Gold travels back in time to stop Barbara Gordon from being crippled and sexually assaulted by Joker. Does he succeed? Nope. In fact, he gets his ass handed to him by Joker. Somebody goes back in time again to stop it. But fails again. And again, and again, and again, and again, and again. It's kind of like ReZero, but instead of like him eventually figuring out a way to win, uh, he just doesn't. He, he's just always losing in this. Batman would eventually confront Booster Gold about this, and thanks him for trying to stop it, and even offers his friendship. Batman, Dark Knight of the Round Table. Dark Knight of the Round Table is a two-part Elseworlds story released in 1998 and 1999, written by Bob Layton. The story follows Batman, who in this universe is named Bruce of Waynesmore, as he serves King Arthur and rides around on a unicorn. He, along with the rest of the Knights of the Round Table, battled Mordred and Ra's al Ghul. Originally, he was exiled from Camelot along with the rest of his family when he was just a kid. This is where his parents were brutally murdered by giant bat demons, summoned by the sorceress Morgana Le Fay. So Bruce is then raised by Merlin, who is also a giant bat for some reason, and is trading combat. He's given a magical suit of armor that allows him to teleport, so that's pretty cool. Uh, but Robin is brutally murdered by an assassin, so that's not cool. And after defeating Ra's al Ghul, Mordred, and Morgana Le Fay, the day is saved, and the comic ends with a time jump to World War II, where the Batplane is seen shooting down Nazi planes. I guess he became immortal or something. Gearhead First appearing in Detective Comics issue 712 in August 1997, Nathaniel Finch was an abomination against life itself. Sounds harsh, but uh, look at him. Before he became... this, he was a criminal who fell into a frozen lake and almost died. Fortunately, or unfortunately for him, two criminals found his body and brought him to a shady doctor who wanted to experiment with cybernetics. And since much of Nathaniel's body was frozen, he removed all the frozen parts from his body and replaced them with cybernetics. And so he became the supervillain Gearhead. As Gearhead, he can manipulate his body to be whatever he wants. Well, okay, it's not like Venom or Sandman where he can just like manipulate his limbs, like turn to whatever. He has to like build the stuff first. Uh, and that probably takes a lot of time, but uh, still. He's basically just a human torso connected to a car or a Mac or is a car. He's shown up a couple times, and with each of his appearances, he just gets grosser and grosser looking. Surprisingly, Gearhead has yet to rejoin the DC Universe in the post-New 52 world, but he has appeared in other continuities, and even the Batman cartoon, though he's a lot less gross in this world and is a criminal racer. Tales from the Dark Multiverse Tales from the Dark Multiverse is an anthology limited series released from October 2019 to December 2020. This series is a spin-off to Dark Knight's Metal, which I talked about earlier, and is about a mysterious man named Tempest who's traveling the Dark Multiverse in search of heroes to help out in the upcoming Dark Knight's Death Metal. Now, this anthology takes iconic DC storylines and messes with them. Basically, what-ifs. Now, I'm not going to talk about every single story in this series, as not every single story involves Batman or a character that's related to Batman, like Robin. So I'll just quickly go over the ones that I'm not going to be talking about. There are stories involving Death of Superman, War of the Gods, Blackest Night, Crisis on Infinite Earths, and Infinite Crisis. 
Now, the stories that involve Batman-related characters include Batman Nightfall, in which in this version of events, John Paul Valley refused to give up being Batman and defeated Bruce and the rest of the Bat family, which allowed him to rule Gotham as the Saint Batman for 30 years. John Paul Valley keeps Bruce alive throughout all of this, though dissects him and tortures him. Bruce is then rescued by the son of Bane and Lady Shiva, and is turned into a cyborg. Together, the three of them defeat Saint Batman, only for Bruce to then immediately kill the son of Bane and Lady Shiva due to his perception of Gotham being warped and takes control of Gotham. There's Batman Hush, in which this version of events, Thomas Elliot's parents raised Bruce instead of Alfred. In this, Thomas Elliot grows up to be the senator of Gotham with the help of his girlfriend, Talia al Ghul. The pair turn Gotham into a militaristic fascist dictatorship and even commit Bruce to Arkham Asylum. Barbara Gordon creates a resistance group to fight back, however, she and the rest of her group don't actually defeat Elliot. Instead, Bruce does, as he's gone insane after discovering Thomas had both Bruce's parents and Thomas's parents killed. So he becomes Batman the Silenced. It kidnaps Thomas along with Scarecrow, Penguin, Harvey Dent, and Jason Todd, and locks them all in cages for the rest of their lives. There's Teen Titans The Judas Contract, in which in this version of events, Dick Grayson accidentally convinces Tara to murder Deathstroke. Tara then takes the same serum that gave Deathstroke his powers, causing her to become a near-godlike entity. At this point, she calls herself Gaia and destroys a majority of the Earth by destabilizing its core. She then goes and kills pretty much every single Teen Titan, and then even Superman. With nobody left to stop her, she rules over the nearly destroyed Earth. And finally, there's Flashpoint, in which in this version of events, Barry Allen dies trying to restore his powers, and so Reverse Flash reshapes the world to his desires. Batman in this universe kills Superman, saving Reverse Flash, so that Reverse Flash will one day bring Bruce back to life. He later then makes a deal with Batman and agrees to rescue the Waynes, as the comic closes with him traveling back in time. Oh, and there's also an issue for Dark Knight's Metal that doesn't really involve Batman or characters related to him, but in this, Duke Thomas creates a new Justice League with one of its members being Joker, who's a dragon now for some reason. Batman in Bethlehem Batman in Bethlehem is an alternate universe that first appeared in Batman issue 666, released in July 2007. Though this universe would be further expanded upon in the Damien Son of Batman miniseries, released through 2013 and 2014. This universe is set 15 years into the future, and as Damian Wayne finally take up the mantle of Batman, after Batman, who is Dick Grayson at this point, is killed by an exploding Joker fish. Ma imagine training a kid from the age of, like, 8 into becoming, like, the ultimate crime fighter, and the dude gets taken down by an exploding Joker fish. And after becoming Batman, Alfred dying, Bruce dying, and killing a Joker imposter, Damien sold his soul to the devil. No, not metaphorically, I mean he literally sold his soul to the devil. He only did this so that he can gain superpowers, like immortality and healing abilities. And almost instantly after he gets these powers, the world gets infected with a Joker virus that turns people into Joker-like zombies. And then Talia al Ghul convinces the US government to uh, nuke Gotham. It's a troubling little universe where nothing bad ever happens. Batman Assault on Arkham 2 Originally, the Arkhamverse animated movie, Assault on Arkham, was going to have at least one sequel. The first film's director, Jay Oliva, stated in 2016 that he actually had plans for the project. However, just one year later in 2017, he left Warner Bros. Animation, so any plans for a sequel were scrapped. Spider-Man 3 in the very beginning of The Dark Knight, you can actually see a teaser poster for Spider-Man 3. This is because they filmed The Dark Knight while Spider-Man 3 is being released. So I guess in universe, the Raimi trilogy and by extension Marvel exists. The Day Batman Sold Out In a story featured in Batman issue 191, released in March 1967, Batman announces to the world that he's quitting, and that he'll be selling all of his gadgets. This leads into a live televised auction as people from the Wayne Foundation arrive to buy the Batmobile, or the Batclaw, or a Batarang, or the Batbat, or the Batboat, or the Bathorse, or the Batgun, or the Bat Sponge, or the Bat Dog, or the Bat Calzone. Are these bat jokes doing anything for you? Because I they're not doing anything for me. It's then revealed that Batman isn't actually giving up, and that this was just an elaborate plan of his to track down a criminal. 
This criminal is named Ira Radon. He was a person that Batman's fought before, and he accidentally fell into a thing of radioactive material which burned him and is slowly killing him. And in order to get revenge before eventually passing away due to the radiation poisoning, he's been shooting radioactive beams at Batman's gadgets every single night so that eventually Batman would die of radiation poisoning. Because Ira was the only person who attended the auction that wasn't from Wayne Foundation, Batman was able to easily find him, and the two battled it out, until Ira eventually dies by accidentally walking into one of his own radiation bombs. CBS Mike Henry Batman A few years before the Adam West Batman series was released, CBS attempted to create a live-action Batman show that would have starred football player and Tarzan actor by Henry. This show was intended to be exclusively for children. While this show would predate the Electric Company for a few decades, I imagine it'd be kind of like that with Spider-Man, but in the 1960s. Sadly for CBS, the show went into development hell, and eventually they even tried to sell the rights to the show to NBC in 1965, but were declined, and so the show was finally cancelled. Batman Hangs a Dude In Batman Issue 1, released in April 1940, Yes, this is Batman's first standalone comic. Hugo Strange turns a bunch of Arkham inmates into giant monsters, kinda like the Venom Titans from the Arkham series. After tricking one of the giants to murder another giant and kicking Hugo Strange off a cliff, Batman ensnares a giant around his neck with a noose and lifts him up into the air with a bat plane, lynching him basically. Batman then says he's probably better off this way, and then cuts the corpse free in the middle of the city. What a fun introduction to the Dark Knight. Superman and Batman, Doom Link. This is an Elseworlds story released in 1995, and with a cover like that, it's not surprising. Written by Christopher Priest, this universe has Superman and Batman working together at a metropolis, but without any superpowers. Yep, Superman doesn't have any actual powers in this. In order to gain abilities, the duo must put on Cyberlink armor that also grants them the ability to interface with technology. In the story, the pair work together to capture Lex Luthor, who's terrorizing the city in his new power armor. After taking down a bunch of kryptonite robots, Batman trolls Lex Luthor by recalibrating Luthor's escape portal straight into a prison cell. It's a very simple comic that was only created as a promotional insert inside the Superman and Batman Cyberlink Armor Multipack toy that Kenner released that year. Batman, Book of the Dead. Book of the Dead is a two-part Elseworld story released in 1999. In this universe, Bruce Wayne comes from an archaeologist family, archaeologists that mostly studied ancient Egypt, and so Bruce grew up fascinated with ancient Egypt. After his parents discover an Egyptian bat god named Necron, they're killed by a hitman, and so Bruce becomes Batman, where he would then solve the riddle of the Sphinx, which gave him the knowledge on how to save humanity from an upcoming polar shift. But that's only half the story. The other half of the story focuses on Necron in ancient Egypt, where it's revealed that he's not actually a bat god, but an ancient alien who participated in the building of the pyramids, and the Sphinx. Necron wasn't exactly a good dude, but all that changed when he sided with Isis and Osiris against the Dark Lord alien set. Necron would then write the riddle of the Sphinx, but at the cost of his own life, but he was luckily able to kill Lord Set before he died, and eventually history forgot about him. Basically, Batman Book of the Dead is Batman Ancient Aliens, the Iron Sky In Robin Annual 5, released in June 1986, we see an alternate reality set in the far future. The story follows Triss Plover, who becomes the new Robin after meeting Batman, who isn't Bruce Wayne in this universe. She lives in a giant spaceship called Gotham. That's basically a tiny world. Think the colonies from Gundam. Together with Batman, she battles the evil forces of the government, and under Batman's orders, she finds the ship's navigational computer. Batman then orders her to set the ship's flight path to a planet that can hold life, in order to free the citizens of the ship from the fascist government. However, after doing this, Triss discovers that it's going to take 300 years in order for the ship to make it to that planet. Outnumbered and trapped on a now enemy spacecraft, she turns herself in and the government decides not to throw her in prison, but to kill her and then chop up her body into tiny pieces to be used as fertilizer. Rest in peace, Tress Plover. Rest in pieces. Batman got away, though, so there's, there's that. Cancelled Gotham City Sirens film. Alright, so this film isn't, like, officially cancelled yet, 
but with every new DCEU announcement, the film gets less and less likely to be made, so I'll just throw it in here. In December 2016, Warner Bros. announced a film about the Gotham City Sirens, a team consisting of Harley Quinn, Poison Ivy, and my wife Catwoman. Originally, Jared Leto was also signed on to appear in the film as Joker, but that's probably not going to happen anymore. The film's director was also announced as David Ayer, with the script being done by Genev Robertson Dwarit. The film was going through production normally until around 2018 when DC postponed production on the film in favor of Birds of Prey. As of right now, four years after it being put on hold, the only updates we've ever gotten on the film were from January 2020, where David Ayer confirmed that the film is still on hold, not cancelled, and Margot Robbie saying that she wanted to make Birds of Prey first in order to introduce audiences to lesser known characters, and that she's still actively pushing for DC to make the film. It's possible this film will eventually happen, but I kind of doubt it. The Two-Way Crimes of Two-Face The Two-Way Crimes of Two-Face is a cancelled episode of the Adam West Batman series. This would have been Two-Face's only appearance in the show, and uh, that's why it was cancelled. You see, the studio was worried that Two-Face's scars would be too gruesome for children, so the episode was ultimately scrapped. Though the script of the episode was made. And eventually, in November 2014, as part of the Batman 66 comic series, the episode's script would be adapted into a one-shot titled The Lost Episode. And very briefly in the opening montage of the 2017 film Batman vs. Two-Face, there's a short adaptation of a scene from the scrapped episode. Sportsmaster First appearing in All-American Comics issue 85 in May 1947, Lawrence Kroc, aka Sportsmaster, was originally a villain of the original Green Lantern, in Earth 2. He'd eventually be retconned into a different universe, known as Earth 1, where a majority of the DC Universe happened before New 52. In this universe, he'd be a foe against many different people, not just Green Lantern, with Batman, Robin, and Batgirl being fairly common foes. Most notably in Batman Family Issue 7, released in October 1976, where he and Huntress teamed up to capture Batgirl and Robin, and forced them to compete in ancient Roman-style games against each other. Before being a villain, he was known as Crusher Croc, and played professional sports. However, after intentionally hurting an opponent during a football match, he was banned from playing any sport on a professional level. And so, he became a criminal that used sports-themed weapons, like exploding baseballs, basketballs, exploding hockey pucks, etc. He'd even go on to marry the Huntress though he'd eventually retire from crime for a while after losing a Villains vs. Heroes baseball game. No, that's uh, not a joke. In DC Superstars issue 10, released in December of 1976, a baseball team consisting of Sportsmaster, Huntress, Lex Luthor, Joker, Weather Wizard, and some lesser-known villains like Matter Master and Tattooed Man would play a game of baseball, their criminal careers at play. They'd ultimately lose, so Sportsmaster retired. Until years later, where he'd join up with Polka Dot Man and Condiment King in Final Crisis Aftermath Issue 4. Huh. This is the third time I brought up this issue. The last two times I talked about it, I brought up how Condiment King and Polka Dot Man were both killed in it. Well, I'm sure Sportsmaster will be fine. Except he's not, actually. Yeah, no, he dies as well, because of course he does. Though he has returned to the New 52 universe with Batman Incorporated Issue 4 in December of 2012. And now he has a segue. Oh, and I should probably mention Victor Gover, another person who called himself Sportsmaster who first showed up in Manhunter issue 17 as a former member of the Gotham City Wildcats, who was falsely accused of taking steroids. So in retaliation, he attacked his former coach, but was ultimately stopped by Batman and Manhunter. The CW's Gotham Knights In 2022, it was reported that the CW had ordered a pilot for a show based on Gotham Knights. No, not based off the game, though it's obvious the show has been to write off the hype for that game. It's based on the comic team of the same name, which is basically just the Bat family, but a bit expanded. And by that I mean, it's actually not based on that team at all. No, no, it's just using the name to write off the game. Instead, the show is about the aftermath of Bruce Wayne's murder, and will have a former Robin, we don't know which one, being framed for his murder and joining forces with the children of Batman's villains. So... The Descendants from Disney. I don't want to sound mean, but if this does end up getting a show, I am not exactly expecting it to be good. Batman, Last Night on Earth. Last Night on Earth is an Elseworld story released from May 2019 to December 2019. Written by Scott Snyder, this story sees Superman being killed by Lex Luthor, 
which leads to Luther giving a big old speech to the world about how people should take everything from themselves and that superheroes are bad. While in the Hall of Justice, Bruce was like, I'm gonna let this giant mob in. I'll let them choose to see what they do for themselves. I mean, we can trust them, right? And then the mob comes in and uh, rips everyone to pieces with Bruce being mutilated and set on fire. Only just barely surviving, Bruce then decides to take over the world and uses Darkseid's severed head to emit the anti-life equation, or he slowly began to take over the world. He became a fascist dictator who forced Catwoman to work with him, and even had Alfred executed after discovering that Alfred had released Bruce's clone into the world to discover what happened to it. Oh yeah, the clone. Yeah, this story actually follows Bruce's clone, who was made so that after Bruce dies, somebody else can continue the war on crime. After being set free from his confinement by Alfred, the clone discovered the severed head of Joker in a jar, and so the two of them traveled the endless desert while being attacked by giant Green Lantern babies. Just, just roll with it, alright? And villains like Bane and Scarecrow, and a Superman clone. Eventually, they team up with a bunch of DC characters like Wonder Woman, Dick Grayson, etc. to battle Bruce. The clone would even put Joker's head into a robotic suit to help out, and uh, eventually they won, and Bruce was killed. The clone would then use a machine made by Lex Luthor to bring a baby Superman to their timeline through a wormhole. The Last Smile The Last Smile is the name of a one-shot comic set in an alternate universe, released in Joker 80th Anniversary, 100-page, Super Spectacular, released in June 2020, written by Paul Dini. In this universe, Joker has a recurring nightmare where he gets executed via electric chair for all of his crimes, while Batman just kind of stands and laughs at him, and he's eventually surrounded by demonic Batman laughing at him. This ultimately leads to Harley leaving Joker, as Joker tells Harley the story, and she's upset that she was never in the dream. Honestly, this story shouldn't really be on this iceberg, because it's not too much to talk about, but... Joker being flat out executed via electric chair is something that I just had to talk about. Batman, Dark Knight Dynasty. Dark Knight Dynasty is an Elseworlds story, released in November 1997, that tells the story of three different Batman across history, in a battle against the immortal being known as Vandal Savage, who got his power from a meteor. So think like the Joe Stars vs. Dio. Written by Mike W. Marr, the first story is about Sir Joshua Wainwright, a Templar Crusader in the year 1222, who battles Savage as he's trying to bring a meteorite down to Earth so that he may gain more power. He's thankfully able to stop him, and declares that his family will forever be sworn enemies of Savage. He then goes on to tell the rest of his Templar buddies about what happened, and they're just like, Nah, you're lying, dude. So they burn him at the stake for heresy. The story then jumps to present day, with Bruce Wayne becoming Batman after his parents are murdered on the day of his wedding. He gets the idea to dress up as Batman by looking at a painting of Joshua Wainwright. He then tracks down the killer, Savage, who has hijacked a Wayne Enterprise space shuttle and is again trying to get that meteorite. The two battle it out in the space shuttle, which results in the both of them crashing back into Earth, with Bruce disintegrating in the atmosphere. And finally, we cut to the future, in 2500, where New Gotham floats over the ruins of the original Gotham. Think the Astro Boy movie, you know, for all the two people in the audience who have seen the Astro Boy movie. The newest member of the Wayne family tree, Brenna Wayne, discovers a weird pattern throughout history. For the past 13 generations, a Wayne member has died while spending the last few days of their lives dressed up as Batman. And so then she decides to do that too. She becomes Batwoman and has a chimpanzee sidekick. She ends up battling Vandal Savage for the final time in space, where Brenna defeats him as she sends him adrift floating through space for eternity on a meteorite, while she returns to Earth safely. Oh my god, this really is Jojo. Batgirl Miscarriage so in Batman Beyond 2.0, a sequel comic to the animated series Batman Beyond, Terry McGinnis and an elderly Dick Grayson meet up, and it's revealed that Dick Grayson hates Bruce with a passion. You see, remember how earlier in the comic I mentioned how Bruce's longest lasting relationship in the DCAU was probably with Barbara Gordon? Well, he impregnated her while Dick Grayson was away. Now she wasn't dating Dick at the time, so she wasn't cheating on him, but Bruce knew that Dick still had feelings for her. And Bruce then decides to tell Dick about it. And, uh, Dick's not very happy to say the least. But don't worry, it gets worse. As this is happening, Barbara tries to stop a mugging and miscarries while doing it. I refuse to believe that this is canon. I refuse. 
Batman Venom. Batman Venom is a storyline written from March 1991 to July of the same year, lasting five issues. Written by Dennis O'Neill, it tells the story of Batman taking enhancement drugs after failing to save a little girl from drowning. After she dies because Batman's unable to lift the boulder, he goes to her father and tells him the news. And her dad's like, dude, I don't care. <laughs> Look, I made some drugs. You want some? And Batman's like, uh, no. Wait, maybe, okay, maybe later. So then he goes off to take down the guy who kidnapped the little girl and gets his ass kicked. So then he's like, okay, I'll take the drugs and then beats the shit out of the dude. After a few weeks, Bruce is completely addicted to the drug and starts going mad with power, beating the crap out of criminals. Well, as it turns out, the dude who's been making the drugs is doing this to get Batman under his control. And so when Alfred leaves Bruce because of his drug problem, Bruce finally realizes he does have a problem, but asks for more drugs anyways because he's addicted. The criminal then tries to make Bruce kill Commissioner Gordon for more drugs, but Bruce refuses and has Alfred lock him in the Batcave for an entire month to rid himself of the drugs. After curing himself, he and Alfred then travel to the criminal's base of operations and take them down after a few complications, like how Alfred gets briefly captured and almost eaten by a shark. Batman Arkham Underworld Arkham Underworld is a lost Arkham game released in 2015, developed by Turbine Inc. for the iPhone. The game is about the many criminals of Gotham working together to create a criminal empire by getting resources and defeating rival gangs. There are many different characters in the game, but only a few of the villains are actually playable. These being Riddler, Harley Quinn, Killer Croc, Mr. Freeze, Scarecrow, and Bane. While characters like Deadshot, Penguin, and Two-Face just appear in cutscenes. We also get the first appearance of Arkham Falcone, so uh, that's something. And during the main part of the gameplay, Batman will occasionally show up and try to stop you. So you gotta beat the crap out of him. The game is extremely loose when it comes to canon. Honestly, I'd argue it's non-canon, but for some reason there was a really big push to make people know that this was an official Arkham game, so I'm not too sure. Regardless, the game was shut down in 2017, so you can't play it anymore. And uh, side note, this is the only Arkham game in existence where Joker is not part of the game. KG Beast starves to death. In Batman issue 420, released in June 1988, Batman kidnaps Ronald Reagan and brings him to the Commodore Hotel in order to protect him from KG Beast, who's trying to assassinate him. Later in the issue, Batman battles KG Beast in the sewers after the latter falls for a fake Ronald Reagan decoy, who was actually Alfred in disguise. The two battle it out for a while until eventually KG Beast accidentally finds himself in a storage room while trying to escape. He turns around to fight Batman and challenges him to a death match. But Batman's like, LOL, Lamau, and locks him in there saying he's going to break his one rule and basically lets KG Beast starve to death in the sewers. After its release, DC probably looked at this comic and was like, uh, you, you, you can't have Batman just like let a dude starve to death. And so 19 issues later in Batman issue 439, Batman reveals that he had actually informed the police about KG Beast locked in the sewers. But for those 18 issues in between, readers were left wondering, did Batman just murder KG Beast? Fun fact, did you also know that KG Beast is in Batman v Superman? Maxi Zeus and the Olympians Maximilian Zeus, yes, that's his real name, first appeared in Detective Comics issue 483, released in May 1979. A former Greek history teacher turned crime lord, Maximilian Zeus created the crime organization, the New Olympians, and went by the supervillain name, Maxi Zeus. Now you're probably looking at this dude like, well, why is he dressed like Zeus? Well, because after the death of his wife, Maximilian went insane and started to believe that he was actually just Zeus reincarnated. And I guess his followers believe that too. He's fought Batman a number of different times, like when he kidnapped an Olympic athlete and tried to force her to marry him to become the mother of his daughter in Batman the Outsiders issue 14. However, he'd eventually disappear from comics for a bit, until he came back into the spotlight to try to re-establish Ares' rule on Earth. But during this whole big crisis, he faked his death and escaped justice, only for a year later to show up running in an illegal casino and eventually getting arrested there. Though he did eventually get cured of his insanity, and he even built a public school using money from the Joker, which made Joker pretty mad, and so Joker blew up the school, killing a dozen children, which caused him to revert back into his insanity, uh, yeah, he didn't, he didn't really have a nice ending. As for his powers, he has none. 
Like, you'd think somebody who claims to be Zeus would have, like, lightning powers or thunder or something, but, uh, nope. He's got none. He was eventually brought back to the DC Universe post New 52 in Batman Eternal issue 16, released in September 2014, where he's now extremely jacked up, so he's a bit more dangerous than his old counterpart. Despite being a rather silly villain, he has shown up in quite a few pieces of media, like the Batman cartoon, the DCAU, Harley Quinn, and even got a mention in Batman Arkham Asylum and City. King Batman This is the name of an alternate universe shown in Batman Shadow of the Bat Annual 4, released in November of 1996. It was part of an event DC was doing at the time that showcased possible futures throughout the multiverse, called Legends of the Dead Earth. In this universe, set 20 billion years into the future at the end of time, where we see He Who Dares, who is the embodiment of all evil, tell the story about how this lifeless universe started out. Billions of years ago, Bruce Wayne the 23rd led New Gotham City into war with the Lizard People. Well, I mean, he, he led via, like, the monarchy. He didn't actually, like, lead the charge. That was Dick Grayson, who took over as Batman and led the people into war with the Lizard People. An enormous society of reptilians who are hellbent on taking the world over, as they feel the world is rightfully theirs. Which it kind of is. This isn't Earth. Uh, humanity landed on this planet centuries beforehand and subjugated them as weak, and so they're kind of mad and want to take back their planet. But yeah, anyways, Bruce Wayne the 23rd stayed behind while Dick Grayson and his dinosaur army died because he was afraid of death. And when his people found out that he'd actually faked going out into the battlefield and had Dick Grayson take up the mantle, they weren't exactly thrilled. And so Bruce takes up the mantle as Batman once again and declares that he'll make it up to the people and leads the final battle against the Lizard Men. The Baffler Titus Zonka, aka The Baffler, was a supervillain that first appeared in Robin issue 1 in November of 1993. He's a former jackhammer operator that became sick of his way of life and was just like, I want to be a supervillain. He then teamed up with Clue Master and began leaving behind terrible photos to let Robin and other heroes know what they're up to, which, not surprisingly, led to his defeat and Clue Master's arrest. Though Baffler was able to escape and swore vengeance on Robin and Spoiler. And, uh, well, he did get his revenge, because he captured both of them. Granted, they only fell for his trap because the messages he was sending them were mistaken for a child's, but, I mean, he still won in the end. Only for him to bang his head on a couple pipes while gloating and uh, fall unconscious. So, uh, revenge didn't last very long. And that was pretty much the last time he did anything of note. He uh, has also not come back in the New 52, so... Just kind of gone. The Gift Batman The Gift is a three-part Batman story arc released from June to July 2018, written by Tom King, and tells the story of Booster Gold, giving Batman a gift for his wedding. This gift was Booster Gold going back in time to save Bruce Wayne's parents, in order to show Batman that his life in the present is so much better than the possible world where his parents lived. Seems like a nice enough gesture, right? Well, in this new reality, Dick Grayson is Batman and has absolutely no issue with killing. Uh, in fact, he uses an assault rifle to kill criminals and yeah, he just kind of does that. Also, Catwoman's here, and she's wearing the Batman Returns outfit, and she's also a serial killer, and doesn't talk, but instead makes cat noises. And so Booster finds her and is like, I'm gonna bring you to Bruce. And so he brings her to Wayne Manor, where she ends up murdering Alfred and Thomas Wayne. Batman then shows up to fight her, and in the scuffle, he accidentally shoots Martha Wayne to death, which causes Bruce to kill him. Basically, everybody here dies except for Booster Golden Bruce. It's a fun little reality. One that Bruce isn't exactly fond of for some reason. I mean, I can't imagine why. And so he tries to get Brewster Gold to go back in time again to save his parents from Batman and Catwoman. But instead, Brewster brings him to the night his parents died in the alleyway. And then another Brewster Gold shows up. There's a big old scuffle. And after Bruce sees his parents die again, he screams and endgames himself. So the universe is undone, and Brewster Gold now has severe PTSD. Fun story. Mr. Camera. First appearing in Batman issue 81 in February of 1954, Mr. Camera was a supervillain who recorded all of his crimes. He did this because he just had a thing for cameras, I guess. I mean, the dude literally wore a camera-shaped helmet. Despite being kind of goofy, he actually was able to record Batman and Robin, revealing their true identities. 
And when Batman and Robin found out about this, they found the tapes of them, and... Well, it turns out that, yeah, he recorded them, but not really. You see, the footage was so obscured, it was impossible to figure out who they actually were. So, Mr. Camera failed. His powers include... Well, I mean, he can project light, and he has a really hot light bulb he can threaten people with. And that's, that's kind of it. Despite this being his single appearance in 1954, he's since become an extremely minor joke character in the modern era. For example, he shows up in Brave and the Bold, Batman 66, and has even shown up in the post-252 universe in Harley Quinn's Villain of the Year in February of 2020. Wayne Family Adventures Wayne Family Adventures is a webtoon exclusive comic series that started out in September 2021 and it's still ongoing. And it's quite literally just, what if the Bat Family had a slice of life comedy manga? I haven't read it because, to be honest, it doesn't really interest me at all, but from what I've heard, people seem to like it. Not really much else to say, I mean, it's exactly what it looks like. The Bat Family just hangs out and does slice of life stuff. The comic does confirm that Alfred's an insanely good cook, though, which... Actually, now that I think about it, that's always kind of been a thing. Sterling Silversmith. First appearing in Detective Comics issue 446 to April 1975, Sterling T. Silversmith was a supervillain who was obsessed with silver and only silver. No, really, like gold, iron, rubies, emeralds. Uh, the dude didn't want any of that. He just wanted silver. As not only did he just love silver, he also believed that the world's gold would become worthless and be replaced with silver in just a couple of years. So he was just trying to get ahead. He also murdered his brother, and tried to smuggle his skeleton out of the country through a silver Batman statue. So, yeah, he's also a murderer. After being caught for this crime, he only did one other thing of note, where he kidnapped the crime doctor to learn Batman's identity. But other than that brief scuffle, he hasn't really done much. In fact, that was his last major appearance ever in Detective Comics issue 495 in October of 1980. Since then, he's only made brief appearances in the post-New 52 world, first showing up in Gotham Academy issue 18 in July 2016, where he's no longer a criminal and is just a teacher now. Though he still has an obsession for silver, and he has a cane sword. As for his powers, he doesn't have any. Though he does wear a suit made of silver that can deflect bullets. And his silver cane is actually a secret gun. Legally not Joker and Harley Quinn. So for a various number of reasons on the show Gotham, a show that had pretty much all Batman's villains, from Riddler, Penguin, Poison Ivy, Mad Hatter, Mr. Freeze, Hugo Strange, Firefly, Bane, Scarecrow, etc., they couldn't use Joker or Harley Quinn. For Joker, this was because DC wanted to reserve the name for the DCEU. So they just created Jerome and Jeremiah as their Joker. But they, again, couldn't call him Joker, despite him obviously being Joker. Or, or I guess not him, like them, because there's two of them. I I didn't watch Gotham, I don't care, I just, all I know is there's two of them. Oh, we know there's a third one too. Whatever, there's not, that's not important. Anyways, they couldn't also have green hair, as that was apparently off limits. As for Harley Quinn, they couldn't use her either. They did have the character Echo in the show, and she was, I mean, very clearly meant to be Harley Quinn, as she was Jeremiah's assistant and girlfriend. She even referred to him as Puddin, and wore a Harley Quinn outfit. They decided to do this to Harley's character, as if they couldn't use Joker, then, then it wouldn't really make much sense to use Harley. And so they took both characters and did their own things with them. Batman, Joker's turned up at the Gotham McDonald's. On my way. Robin, meet me at the Gotham City McDonald's. Right, Catwoman's been sighted there. They're ours now. Just imagine Batman's surprise when he finds out everyone's talking about the Batman Happy Meal toys at McDonald's. One of eight exciting action toys or vehicles with each Batman Happy Meal you buy your kids. What you want is what you get at McDonald's today. Why have they been in there so long? They're probably just toying with us, Robin. Batman Murders an Entire Cult In Detective Comics issue 39, released in May 1940, Batman battles a Chinese assassin he calls... Uh, Batman, you, you can't say that. 
But that's the least of his worries, as he finds himself in a battle against the Chinese cult that's kidnapped a couple of millionaires, they had even captured Robin and forced him into a gladiator match. But Batman races in to save the day and decides, I don't really feel like going Arkham mode and, and like taking out the entire room of enemies, so uh, he pushes a giant statue over, which falls and crushes every single member of the cult to death, except for the cult's leader, who Batman personally goes after. All in all, Batman and Robin save the day again. They just had to kill like 20 people to do it. Joker and Darkseid, Trump. The Dark Knight Returns trilogy is well known for its revolutionary first installment, its beyond horrible sequel, and its third installment that nobody really talks about outside of Superman's bulge in that one cover. But little do people actually know, there's a fourth installment. Not The Dark Knight Returns 4, but instead a one-shot comic set after the third installment titled The Dark Knight Returns, The Golden Child, released in February 2020. That is notable, really, only because a Joker impersonator, because let's remember Joker's dead in this universe, and Darkseid work for a parody of Donald Trump. You see, they're managing Governor J.M. Bozo, who is running for president, and is represented by photos of Trump and Brazilian President Bolsonaro, who is also a very bad dude. But they mostly just do, like, the Trump parody things. There's even a Joker version of the domestic terror group, the Proud Boys, called the Joker Boys. Which is a little redundant because the, because, you know, Joker's already, like, you know, a terrorist. This is actually Darkseid's first and only appearance in the Dark Knight Returns universe, which is also something. And, uh, yes, Frank Miller did write this. Harley Quinn Cube. In Arkham Asylum, by the Intensive Treatment Building, if you use mods to get out of the map, you could find a floating cube with Harley Quinn from the animated series on each side. As noted by Batman Arkham videos, objects like this are usually placed outside of maps to measure, scale, and store textures, etc. It's also a physical object and can be walked on and climbed on. The Executioner. First appearing in Detective Comics issue 191 in January 1953, Willie Hooker was a former carnival worker turned bounty hunter. Instead of doing whatever a real-life bounty hunter does, Hooker decided to instead break criminals out of prison and then kill them to claim the reward. He called himself the Executioner and had a giant E on his costume. He didn't do this for very long as Batman and Robin would eventually stop him, and uh, that would be the end of the character forever never to be seen again. Until 2015, when Gotham introduced Nathaniel Barnes, a former police captain turned criminal, who called himself the Executioner. He'd go around killing criminals he deemed as guilty, and would eventually be captured by the JCPD. And that would be the end of the Executioner forever. That is, until 2019, when Burt Rand Eldon showed up in Batwoman, who was, again, another version of the Executioner. This version of the character was a former Executioner at Blackgate, who went around killing corrupt executives at Blackgate as a way of getting revenge for them making him execute innocent inmates. The Curse of the Batman While many people love the Dark Knight trilogy, something that nobody loves about them is how the film's cast had tragedies, injuries, etc. often on set. While offset, Morgan Freeman, only a month after The Dark Knight came out in 2008, got into a serious car accident that left both him and his passenger seriously injured. A month prior to that incident in July 2008, Christian Bale was arrested for allegedly assaulting his mom and sister at the Dorchester Hotel shortly before the film's premiere in London. And a year prior, in October 2007, while filming The Dark Knight, a special effects technician was killed when his camera truck crashed into a tree while filming. And then, of course, there's the tragic death of Heath Ledger. All these incidents have led some people to believe in the curse of the Batman, a theory that the trilogy was cursed. Probably not. It was more than likely just coincidences and that's that's a, that's really it second batman beyond film as revealed by bruce tim there were talks about a second batman beyond film that it would ultimately be scrapped because of how controversial return of the joker was you see this second film would have focused on catwoman and would have been quote really dark i mean pitch black it was never scripted, it only had a 45-minute impromptu plotting session between Glenn Murakami and Bruce Timm. Despite this, we actually know quite a few plot details that would have been in the film. First, it was going to be revealed that Selina Kyle had actually cloned Bruce instead of Amanda Waller. In fact, uh, she created a ton of Bruce Wayne clones, 
and eventually when they get to a proper age, she'd come in and murder their foster parents in an attempt to create more Batman. But this didn't really work, as only Terry and another boy that she'd raise as her own son would eventually become Batman-like characters. This clone of Bruce would have been one of the main antagonists of the film, and would have killed several reoccurring Batman Beyond villains and an elderly Riddler to catch the attention of Terry. So you're probably now thinking, why would Catwoman do this? Well, because she realized Batman was right, and that she should use her talents to help people out, not hurt people. So she decided to create a Batman who'd kill criminals in order to help people. Overall, this was, uh, an interesting idea for a film. But like I said, it didn't end up happening because Return of the Joker was already viewed as too dark. Harley Quinn kills Hitler. So DC bombshells to the universe where the female superheroes of the DC universe defend the United States from Nazis and other evildoers during World War II. Originally just a line of figures created by DC, they gave the line their own comic series. Each of the main characters in this universe are designed to be like World War II pinup girls. Harley Quinn, Batgirl, Batwoman, and Amanda Waller are just some of the Batman-related characters that exist in this world. But you're probably wondering, that's great and all, but how did Harley Quinn kill Hitler? Well, as revealed in Harley's Little Black Book, issue 4, released in October 2016, Harley Quinn from the New 52 universe traveled to the DC Bombshells universe and gets into a little scuffle with Hitler in his car, which ultimately leads to Harley driving his car off a cliff and shooting the engine, blowing up the car presumably killing him. This is all cool and great, but nothing is ever going to top how Duke Nukem managed to take Hitler down. Scrapped Peacemaker cameo. In the Peacemaker Season 1 finale, Wonder Woman, Superman, Flash, and Aquaman show up to save the day, but are late to the party. In this cameo, only Flash and Aquaman were played by the respected DCU actors, while Wonder Woman and Superman were just body doubles. Originally, this scene was going to include the entire Justice League, but since Warner Bros. has no plans for Cyborg, Cyborg was never intended to show up. So they originally shot the scene with the entire Justice League, minus Cyborg. Meaning that yes, Batman was also there. But due to Warner Bros. wanting to get rid of Batfleck, they told James Gunn they couldn't use Batman. So they had to edit out Matt Turner, who was playing Batman here. Weird that they're removing Batfleck from the DCEU with The Flash, which is like, set after Peacemaker Season 1. Like, why couldn't he have shown up here as, like, a little thing before getting his, like, sent off? Kind of weird. Sweet Tooth. First appearing in, and only appearing in, the New Adventures of Batman cartoon in the late 70s, Sweet Tooth was a supervillain with two goals in mind. To turn Gotham City's water supply into fudge, where he'd then restore the water, but only after Gotham City paid a ransom. The other goal was to make every child in Gotham addicted to candy, where he then groomed them into being obese, candy-addicted criminals like him at his sweet school. He had quite a few candy-themed weapons up his sleeve, like the donut launcher, licorice whip, ice cream cannon, and giant gumball. But thankfully for Gotham, Batman was able to put an end to Sweet Tooth's reign of candy-coated evil. Sportsman Sportsmaster isn't the only sports-themed villain to face off against Batman. First appearing in Batman issue 338 in August 1981, Martin Mantle Jr. had no interest in sports as a kid, which really pissed off his evil scientist father, who decided to create a super serum to make him the ultimate athlete. When Martin's mom found out, there was a divorce, and that was it. The dad was never sent to jail. Later in life, Martin would become an athlete because of the serum, but eventually the serum began to destroy his body with a deadly disease. So, naturally, Martin took up the mantle of Sportsman, and began murdering top sports stars until Batman would eventually stop him. He didn't really have any powers, he was just kind of like a really good athlete who was a serial killer, so he had like knives and exploding hockey pucks and stuff. Since this appearance, he has never ever returned, and in this continuity, probably died in prison. Batman Nevermore Batman Nevermore is an Elseworlds story that ran for five issues. It tells the story of Edgar Allan Poe working alongside Batman in the late 1800s to stop a man who's been murdering Baltimore's elites. There's also a giant raven monster involved because, I mean, it's Edgar Allan Poe. This giant raven monster would eventually be revealed to be a creation of Scarecrow, who's the story's true main antagonist. Written by Len Wen, this miniseries has sadly been kind of forgotten about, despite it having a fairly unique and interesting variation of Scarecrow, and it's one of the longer Elseworld miniseries. 
The Graysons. The Graysons was a canceled CW show in the late 2000s that would have focused on Dick Grayson's years before becoming Robin. So it basically would have been Smallville, but for Robin. The Graysons was announced in October 2008, but was canceled literally a month later with Warner Bros. executive Jeff Rubinov saying the concept of the show did not fit with the aim of the current Batman franchise. Which, uh, yes, means that because the Dark Knight happened, the Graysons didn't. Batman, the Blue, the Grey, and the Bat. The Blue, the Grey, and the Bat is an Elseworlds story released in 1993, written by Elliot S. Magan and Alan West. That, as the name suggests, is a story taking place in the Old West, as Colonel Bruce Wayne takes up the mantle of Batman to protect a shipment of gold for Abraham Lincoln. This job turns into a Wild West adventure, as his bat horse is killed, and he eventually takes up a sidekick named Redbird, a young Native American boy, and battles both Native Americans and Bloody Bob Armstrong and the Strong Arm Boys. It's your standard rootin' tootin' cowboy western story, with Batman very loosely thrown in. No, really, outside of Batman, Alfred, and Robin, there's no other DC characters who get western-fied. Not even a single Batman villain, which is a real missed opportunity. In fact, you would expect, like, Jonah Hex to show up, but no, he doesn't either. Film Freak First appearing in Batman issue 395, released in May 1986, Burt Weston was a failed actor who loved playing villains, because he claimed that they were more complex than heroes. So naturally, he'd eventually become a supervillain after faking his death, to get publicity, but that didn't really work as everyone kind of forgot about him. So now as the villain film freak, he commits crimes based off of old films like White Heart, King Kong, Planet of the Apes, To Catch a Thief, Psycho, and The Sting. He didn't really have any like powers, he was just kind of a, a film nerd who dressed up as a gorilla once to murder a woman because he was like, it's like King Kong. Uh, Doom was defeated fairly quickly and wouldn't appear too often in the comics. In fact, in Batman issue 492 in May 1993, he died after being put under Mad Hatter's control and was pretty brutally killed by Bane. There would be other film freaks, though. As in Catwoman issue 54 in June 2006, another film freak hosted a late night show where he'd display films made by his minions. And that's kind of really it. I mean, there's not really much to say about this dude. He was just kind of like, again, a film freak. Most recently, this version of Film Freak actually made the jump to New 52 as part of the Suicide Squad in Batman issue 14 in March 2017, only to die after like a handful of appearances. Paul is dead. In Batman issue 222, released in June 1970, Batman and Robin tackle the Paul is dead conspiracy theory. In the story, the duo meet the Oliver Twists, the DC Universe's version of the Beatles. But Robin is convinced that the band member Saul Cartwright is actually dead and that he's been replaced with an imposter. And so the two begin an investigation on Saul, only to discover that Saul isn't actually dead. The rest of the band is. You see, everybody but him was replaced as the rest of the band died in a plane crash, and Saul started up the rumors about his own death to draw the attention towards him. This ultimately leads to the Oliver Twists breaking up and the conspiracy being solved. Lord Deathman's Cruel Fate So Lord Deathman is a pretty crazy supervillain with the power to regenerate from injuries. Also, he dresses like a Call of Duty Operator bundle, so that's something. Apparently his costume is like embedded in his skin so he can't take it off, so that's... that's hell. In Batman Incorporated Issue 2, released in December 2010, Lord Deathman's most recent battle against the Cape Crusader comes to an end, when Batman throws him off a rooftop, defeating him. But before he does that, he says he's going to give Lord Deathman a fate worse than death, probably in response to Lord Deathman killing Jiro, the Batman of Japan. So Batman has the Japanese space program place him in a satellite and launch him into space, doomed to slowly die alone in the freezing vacuum of space, only to regenerate and repeat the process endlessly. But wait, Batman knew that Jiro just faked his death. So why would he Why would he do this if he knew that he was just gonna... Okay. Luckily for Lord Deathman, he did eventually escape the satellite and battle Batman once again. But there was a period of time where readers were just like, 
Oh, Batman just launched a student to orbit for, like, no reason. Shakura the Magician. So there exists a 30-page comic titled Nagraji vs. Shakura the Magician, which is a bootleg comic starting the Indian superhero Nagraji, who battles the space magician Shakura. It's a pretty wacky comic that's only on this iceberg, because the author and artist illegally used Batman, Spider-Man, and Superman in the comic as Nagraji's best friends. And so the story has the four of them teaming up to take down the space mage with the help of a Hindu saint. Superman also throws a dude into an active volcano, which, yes, kills him, so, you know, there's that too. They also murder Captain Lou Albano, which, uh, that, that's not cool. That's not cool at all, actually. It's also not very cool that they take out Shekura the Magician off panel, so you don't even, you don't even see, like, the, uh, the end of that fight. Also, as expected of Batman in this situation, he he just, like, doesn't really do anything throughout it. He just kind of, like, just appears. Like, Superman and Spider-Man do all the heavy lifting, you know? The Maid of Wood Killer. First appearing in Detective Comics issue 786 in November 2003, Samuel Sullivan was a poor Irish immigrant who moved to Gotham City. And after having his store destroyed by Sportsmaster during a battle with Green Lantern, he lost faith in the land of opportunity, and so decided to murder the mayor of Gotham City with a wooden bat, as the mayor had apparently given Gotham citizens false hope. He then decided to carve made of wood into his chest because of symbolism or something, I don't know. Decades later, his grandson Francis Sullivan would discover Samuel's notebook and decided to become the second made of wood killer, only to be defeated by Batman and Green Lantern almost immediately. Granted, he did capture Commissioner Gordon, so there's that. As for his powers, well, neither made of wood killer has any powers, they just have a wooden baseball bat. Batman of Shanghai Batman of Shanghai is a three-part short series released on Cartoon Network's DC Nation block in 2012. It takes the Batman characters, well, just three of them, and places them in 1930s Shanghai. Animated by Wolf Smoke Studios, the story of Batman of Shanghai has Catwoman and Bane battling over the legendary Scroll of Destiny, only for Batman to show up in the middle of it and then take it for himself. Yeah, there's not really much plot here, it's mostly just action. One last thing to note, though, is that this is one of the few universes where Batman has superpowers, as he can now transform his body into a flock of bats. Penguin and Catwoman have sex and then cure COVID-19. In Gotham City Anniversary Giant, released in November 2021, there's a story written by, and I'm not kidding, Danny DeVito. This story is titled Bird Cat Love, and in it, Penguin, who looks just like his Batman Returns variation, so, you know, the Danny DeVito Penguin, and Catwoman are in a relationship, and the two just are constantly banging, until eventually they adopt three penguins and three cats as their kids. They then cure COVID-19 by forcefully vaccinating everyone by making the vaccine airborne. Why did Danny DeVito make this? Well, he explained, and I quote, At first, I was a little bit hesitant about doing the comic, but then I got into the fact that I've always been a big fan of Michelle Pfeiffer, and the Penguin obviously lusts after Catwoman, so I figured I'd put those two together. And then it was also in the middle of the pandemic, which we're still fighting with. I, I thought it'd be good if Penguin had a little bit of Robin Hood in him. So he basically wrote a fan fiction about himself making Catwoman and ending COVID. Thrill Killer. Thrill Killer is a four-part Elseworld miniseries released from January 1997 to March 1998, written by Howard Chaikin. It takes place in 1961, and in this universe, Bruce Wayne is a detective who is often sent after crime-fighting vigilantes, with his most recent case involving Batgirl and Robin. Batgirl in this universe is still Barbara Gordon. But this time, she's a millionaire who buys Wayne Manor from the Waynes, since the Wayne family was ruined by the Great Depression. She's also in love with Bruce, which is a problem for Robin because regard to Cross Stark, which is the name of Robin in this universe, is actually in love with her, so it's a little love triangle going on. And speaking of love, Joker's a woman in this universe, but is still in a relationship with Harley Quinn. Though she's also married and has a husband, so she's cheating. Not exactly the most evil thing Joker's done, but, you know, still pretty mean. Anyways, back to the story. 
Bruce goes after the duo, but when Robin is eventually killed by Joker, Bruce must become the Batman to team up with Batgirl to take down the criminals. Batman. I, Joker. I, Joker is an Elseworlds story released in 1998, written by Bob Hall. It's a really strange story about the Night of Blood, a religious event where people come to defeat the Bruce and become the new Batman. Basically, just like a big Batman cult. This religious event requires people to face off against surgically altered people who have also been brainwashed into thinking they're either Riddler, Ra's al Ghul, Two-Face, Penguin, or the Joker. This, of course, isn't something that everybody likes, and so a resistance group is created to combat the Bruce and his weird Batman cult. The leader of the resistance being named Joe Collins. However, sadly for Joe, he gets captured and turned into the Joker for the Night of Blood. However, unlike everybody else, his memories aren't wiped. And so he escapes the cult and finds the original Batcave, where he also finds the original Batsuit. Putting it on, he challenges the Bruce to a fight to the death, and eventually Bruce is killed, and with that, his Batman cult slowly begins to die. And so now Joe and his wife carry on as Batman and Robin. The Narrow Path In Robin Annual 3, released in September 1994, an alternate universe is introduced called The Narrow Path. This universe is set in ancient Japan and follows Tengu, this universe is Robin, as he's trained to be the next Batman, or I guess Bat Ninja in this universe. After his master Bat Ninja is murdered by ninjas, Robin travels to Asaka Castle to deliver a hidden message stored in his family's sword to their lord Toyotami Hidori, a real historical figure. However, when he gets to the castle, it's under siege, and he has to team up with Cat Ninja to defend it. While there, he finally meets up with Hidori, who reveals that the two are in fact brothers, and it was him that sent the ninjas to kill Tengu and Bat Ninja, because he was afraid Tengu would find out that they were brothers and take up his throne. This starts a fight, and after killing Hidori, Tengu endgames himself because he realizes that he broke his last promise with Bat Ninja, not to avenge him. Brain First appearing in Batman issue 26 in December 1944, Brain, aka Batman 3000, is Batman from the far future. In his time, a robotic alien empire from Saturn arrived on Earth and enslaved all of humanity, including poor Brain. That is, until Brain and his friend Ricky found a time capsule containing a hologram of Batman and Robin in action. So, inspired by their heroics, they become the new Batman and Robin, and lead a revolution against the evil people of Saturn. Also, Brain isn't actually his real name. His real name is Bruce Wayne, but people in the year 3000 combine their first and last names because apparently it's more efficient, so he goes by Brain. Very dumb. Anyways, after the story in 1944, he wasn't really seen again until Batman 700 in August 2010 and a brief cameo that shows Brain and Ricky in a grittier fashion. But that's shockingly not the only Batman named Brain. First showing up in Batman issue 67 in October 1951, Brain Taylor was the Batman from the 31st century. He was inspired to become Batman after seeing footage of Batman and Robin fighting. Which, uh, yes, means that there are two Brain Batmans who were both inspired in the same way. He'd show up a couple of times throughout the decades, once traveling back to recruit the original Robin after his Robin broke his leg, and another time was summoned by Batman to help keep his identity a secret from Vicky Vale. It's also very unclear if this brain is actually a descendant of the other brain, as it's never brought up. I'm going to assume he is though, because I mean, like, come on. State of Survival, the Joker collaboration. State of Survival is an iOS game that's kind of like Clash of Clans or something? I don't know. It looks like that one really terrible Walking Dead mobile game, No Man's Land. I have no idea what this is, I just see ads for it whenever I play Godzilla Defense Force. Anyways, in November of 2021, in a really weird crossover, Joker was added into the game via event, along with his own campaign and trailer. As for the trailer, we see Joker experimenting on... Zombies? I guess that's like a Joker thing to do. As for the campaign, you work with Joker for a bit until he eventually betrays you, which I guess is also a very Joker thing to do. Captain Stingery First appearing in Detective Comics issue 460 in June 1976, Carl Courtney took up the mantle of Captain Stingery after being the black sheep of his family. So, you know, naturally, he became a pirate-themed supervillain, as you do. Side note, I love how the DC wiki lists his lack of two eyes as a weakness. 
Anyways, early in his career, he for some reason convinced himself that his three brothers were actually all Batman. And so Batman came up to Stingery's brothers and was like, Guys, just pretend to be me, bait him into like coming over here, then I can kick his ass. So when Stingery eventually showed up, Batman and Flash, for some reason, he was there too, took him down. This wouldn't be the last time Stingery tried to meet Supervillain though. He would later join the secret society of supervillains at one point, and would later enter a relationship with the Cavalier. So he was a gay supervillain. But obviously at the time, he couldn't come out as gay because, you know, people didn't exactly like gay people back then. So when Black Lightning found out that Stingery was gay, he blackmailed him with that information to become an informant for the Justice League. Something tells me they didn't adapt that in the Black Lightning show. Sadly for Stingery, because he had no powers and just had a sword, he was killed fairly quickly in Secret Six, Issue 7 in May 2009, by a member of the, well, Secret Six. He would briefly return in the New 52 when he believed that his three brothers were Batman, yet again, dressed them up, and then tried to kill them. This time, though, he was stopped by Gotham Girl, which is quite the power difference. It's like if Superman showed up to kick Penny Plunderer's ass. Tim Curry Joker I actually don't know how I forgot to put this in the original iceberg, but um, before Mark Hamill was cast as the Joker in the animated series, Tim Curry was actually signed on to play the Clown Prince of Crime. Tim Curry apparently recorded audio for four entire episodes of the show, but left the show either because he had bronchitis at the time, and the Joker voice was too much of a strain on his voice, or the showrunners didn't care for his takes. Both of these explanations have been reported. There's only been one video of Tim Curry's Joker that's ever been released. Naughty, naughty, you're making me miss the show. Batman, The Abduction. Released in January 1998, The Abduction is an extremely forgotten about Elseworlds story, written by Alan Grant. It tells the story of Batman being abducted by aliens and experimented on, before being dropped back onto Earth. Or at least, that's what it seems like? After doing research on these grey aliens that abducted him, Batman figures out that he never actually was abducted. Instead, he was drugged and had his mind manipulated by a new supervillain named... The Kook. He quickly defeats this new villain, and the day is saved, and there's no aliens. Also, Batman fights Bruce Lee while drugged. I mean, come on. Batman, aliens, and Bruce Lee? It's a classic combination. Just like Captain America, Samurai, and John Cena. And All Might, Mermaids, and Miley Cyrus, you know? Batman Clean and Dirty. Clean and Dirty was a lost segment of Sesame Street. Originally airing in 1970, during the 99th episode of Sesame Street, this animated short lasted 51 seconds, and featured Penguin and his gang in their hideout, which had some really dirty windows. And that was all that was known about this short for decades, until September 16th, 2019, when screenshots of the lost short were uploaded online. And finally, on July 15th, 2021, YouTube user LittleJerryFan92 released the full 51 second segment revealing that the plot of the segment was actually that Batman and Robin are able to get the drop on Penguin because Penguin's lookout couldn't actually see the Dark Knight approaching because of the dirty window. So it was just kind of like telling kids, you know, clean stuff. Golden Streets of Gotham Golden Streets of Gotham is an Elseworld story released in March 2003, written by Jen Van Meter. In this universe, Batman is a man named Bruno Van Cow and works as a laborer during the Industrial Revolution. Early in the story, he discovers that both his parents died in an industrial fire caused by negligence of their boss, Joseph Chillingham. Get it? Joe Chill? Anyways, after being inspired by Selina Kyle, aka the cat, about workers' rights, Bruno became the Batman. He then begins to steal from the rich to give to the poor, much like Robin Hood, which pisses a lot of people off, with a plan even being created to frame Batman for the recent serial killings and industrial fires. And so Batman must now track down the serial killer, who he discovers in a man named Jack Smart, who had been driven insane by all the deaths he's accidentally caused, and is now dressing up like a clown to do his murders. So the Joker. After defeating the Joker and revealing the police corrupted plan to frame him, Bruno unmasks himself and turns himself into the police. It's a neat little outsold story that's been forgotten the time. Citizen Wayne. Citizen Wayne is an alternate universe introduced in Batman Legends of the Dark Knight Annual 4, released in July 1994, written by Mark Waits and Brian Augustin. 
In this universe, instead of becoming Two-Face, Harvey Dent becomes a twisted, murderous Batman after he gets hit by an acid attack. This results in Bruce Wayne having to become his own version of Batman to stop him. Well, I mean, not really Batman, but like, he, he armors up to stop Batman. Harvey is also not really Two-Face in this universe. It's more just like one face, as his entire face got melted by the acid. Anyways, the story comes to a close with Bruce and Harvey battling to the death, which results in Harvey, well, falling to his death. Citizen White is also the name of another alternate universe, introduced in Batman Chronicles 21, released in June 2000. That's very much just a homage to Citizen Kane. With Clark Kent being sent in to interview Robin, Alfred, Catwoman, Commissioner Gordon, and Joker after Bruce dies, and his last word being Rosebud. But instead of Rosebud being a sled, Alfred reveals that Rosebud was simply the word written on the side of the gun used to kill Thomas and Martha Wayne. King Tut First appearing in Batman Confidential 26 in April 2009, Victor Goodman was an Egyptianologist who just loved King Tut. In fact, when the Gotham Museum of Antiquities had the chance to host a King Tut exhibit, he strongly advocated for it, but all of his co-workers were like, Dude, this is Gotham City. If we bring King Tut here, the mummy's just gonna get stolen. So his request was denied. This really pissed him off, and so he turned to a life of crime, calling himself King Tut, and claimed that he was the messenger of the god Aten. He would go on to embezzle money and murder a bunch of the museum's board of trustees. He would also leave Egyptian-themed riddles behind, which really pissed off Riddler. And so Riddler was like, Yo, Batman, let's, like, team up. This dude's stealing my thing. And so the two teamed up to stop King Tut. He didn't exactly have any powers, though. He just had, like, a crook and flail as a weapon. Shockingly, Newman would make his return the New 52 universe in Harley Quinn 38 in April 2018, though he hasn't really done much since his reintroduction. King Tut's also appeared in the Lego Batman movie, I should also mention that King Tut was partially inspired by another villain of the same name that was created for the 1960s Batman show. This King Tut's real name was William McElroy, and would make regular appearances throughout the show. Catwoman 2004 is canon to the Burdenverse. This is exactly what it sounds like. In Catwoman 2004, you can briefly see a picture of Selina Kyle from Batman Returns as one of history's Catwoman. It's a very small easter egg that makes this technically canon to the burden verse. Query and Echo. Probably should have been at the top of the iceberg, but I forgot about them, so I'm putting them here. Sorry. Anyways, it's well known by a good chick of Batman fans that Riddler didn't always work alone. He occasionally had two sidekicks, Query, aka Deandra Vance, and Echo, aka Nina Divino. The duo would make their first appearance in the late 20th century, with Query showing up in Secret Origins Special 1 in October 1989, and Echo showing up in Detective Comics Annual 8 in July 1995. They'd do some stuff with Riddler occasionally, but they weren't always with them. they just, like, occasionally tag along for, for a couple of jobs. In fact, they don't actually have many appearances under their belts. This is because Riddler admitted in Detective Comics issue 822 that he had recruited the duo from an S&M club. So they probably just went back to work there. Warbat Introduced to Detective Comics Annual 9 in August 1996 as part of the Legends of the Dead Earth event I mentioned earlier, this universe takes place in the far, far future on a mysterious planet that's not Earth. This story stars three children who tell each other legends about Batman, almost like Gotham Knight. But that's when they discover a broken down war robot, and decide, okay, let's just, let's screw with it, let's rebuild it. So they rebuild it and name it Warbat. Once it's rebuilt, it instantly goes and does its thing as a weapon of war. It goes on duty looking around for enemies to slaughter. The three kids follow the machine, and two of them eventually dress up like Robin, Finally, the story ends with Warbat and the kids discovering enemy aliens and an enemy robot that resembles the Joker for some reason. And a giant battle takes place with Warbat sacrificing his life in the line of duty to save the day. One Operation Joker So this is a manga that I think is officially licensed. I mean, it has a mal page, so... It's not a doujin. 
This is a comedy story about Batman falling into a pool of chemicals, which causes him to be turned into a baby. And unlike Bat Baby, he can't fight crime. He's just like a literal infant. Joker takes responsibility for this and actually decides to raise Batman. No, this isn't the joke. This is the plot of the manga. It began being published in January 2021 and is still going on today. It's basically your standard slice of life comedy manga, but it stars Joker and Harley Quinn, and it's about them becoming parents to their arch enemy. This has, of course, led to a lot of very surreal and bizarre panels. I highly recommend this story, it's really funny. Alright, when we're done, Batberg 2, Batman Iceberg 2, is uh, done. Yeah, that part of the beginning of the video where I was like, I want to get this out before the Batman came out, or comes out, uh, that, didn't, that didn't age well. <laughs> it didn't age well at all, but it wasn't really my fault. I was sick at the time, so... I was sick at the time when the Batman's released, so I had to push this video back a few days, but, you know, we're all good now. It's done. I never want to talk about Batman again. <laughs> Uh, it, it's funny, every time I finish one of these icebergs, for like, the next two months afterwards, I just don't want to think about the subject ever again. <laughs> like, it's just because I'm, for every day, I've just been, just been Batman, 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 you know? So that's just, yeah. Next is Spider-Man Part 2, and then afterwards, uh, we'll see what happens. And, uh, yeah. This isn't the last time I'll talk about DC stuff. Um, I'm sure I'll do, like, a Batman tier list of some kind down the line um i mean i'll talk about batman stuff in the eventual uh 1979 to 1999 best and worst superhero films of, of uh, every year which is going to happen but it's probably gonna be like shorter because i don't think there's i think there's like a good number of years where there's just like none released so oh well also potentially i'll do a justice league iceberg one day i don't know uh, I don't want to do like a DC iceberg. That's way too. That's like that's like way too big. Uh, so if I narrowed it down to like the Justice League, uh, I think that would be fine. But uh, we'll see what happens. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. On that note, uh, hope you guys had a great day. Hope you guys continue to have great days. And yeah, I'll see you guys in the next video. Peace out.